These people you see on screen are responsible for the deaths of hundreds of people. In this Twisted Minds compilation video, we'll be exploring each and every one of their cases, proving that evil is not defined by location, it does certainly not have an age limit. This brings us to our first case. Niles Hogel was a modern doctor with 85 convicted murder charges. Welcome or welcome back to Twisted Minds. My name is James and this is the case of Niles Hogel, a German former nurse and serial killer who is believed to have claimed the lives of 85 people between 2000 and 2005. However, more recently, police estimate that his victim count could be around 300 over the course of 15 years. If this is true, it would make Niles the most prolific serial killer in modern German history. Niles Hogel was born and raised in West Germany on December 30th, 1976. When he was a small boy, he grew up in the coastal town of Wilhelmshaven in Lower Saxony. Niles said that throughout his childhood, he was never exposed to violence at home. His parents didn't fight any more than a normal set of parents would, and his home was very well put together. He also explained that he grew up in a highly protective atmosphere. These days, most of us would probably call this type of home environment sheltered, and that definitely seems to be the case for Niles. His parents did everything within their power to keep him free from harm and to keep him on the straight and narrow. To top them off, both his father and his grandmother had dedicated their lives to helping people. They were both nurses, and it seems like Niles always looked up to them. His father set a great example for what a nurse should be, after having followed in the footsteps of his own mother. When Niles became of age, he decided that he would become a nurse as well. On the surface, it seemed like Niles also wanted to do everything within his power to help others in his community. However, as time passed by, his desires would become much darker and more sinister. Niles went through very in-depth training to become a nurse. Unlike nursing schools that you may find in the United States and other parts of the world, in Germany at the time, nursing could be taken as a vocational course instead of requiring countless years of college. By 1997, Niles had completed his training and became a nurse, working at Sank Willahad Hospital. He was just 21 years of age. By 2004, Niles had begun to explore other opportunities in life. Niles managed to find love and decided to settle down a bit more. He and his longtime girlfriend were married in 2004, and later that year, his wife would give birth to their daughter. By 1999, Niles had decided to move on from his job at the hospital and began working for a different clinic while holding down an identical position as a nurse. This was a result of accepting a job offer at Oldenburg Clinic. He would be tasked with taking care of patients in the intensive care unit at a cardiatric surgery ward known as Ward 211. Niles had been working here for several years before staff members began to get a bit suspicious of him. By August of 2001, just two years after accepting his new job, a large meeting was called at the clinic. The board members were concerned that a shockingly large number of patients had been losing their lives over the last year. The leaders explained that there was an unusually large number of deaths that had seemingly come out of nowhere. To top this off, there was also an increase in the number of resuscitations and an increase in the number of deaths months after resuscitation. According to the board, 58% of these deaths took place while Niles was on duty. After the meeting had drawn to a close, Niles knew that the leaders of the clinic were on to him. The following day, he would call in sick for work and would remain away from the clinic for a total of three weeks. For Niles, this seemed like the perfect way to lay low. However, he only made his situation worse. This is because after leaving his job for a short time, the number of deaths dramatically decreased at the clinic. For some of the workers who were suspicious of him, this proved that Niles may have had a part in some of the unusual deaths that had been taking place recently. Once he returned back to work, Niles was asked by one of the head physicians in Ward 211 to transfer to a different unit. It's unknown if this was due to a difference in opinion or if the doctor truly felt that Niles' skills would be more useful elsewhere. Nevertheless, Niles accepted his proposal and would soon be transferred to the anesthesiology unit later that year in 2001.
It was at this point that the heat really began to amp up for Niles. The head physician at his new ward explained that he didn't like how Niles always forced himself into emergency situations. To add to this, he explained to Niles that after he would become involved in emergency situations, the patients would have a significantly higher chance of passing away or facing serious difficulties. The doctor never accused Niles of anything outright, but it seems as though his words were very clear. Soon after the two had this conversation, Niles was approached by one of the leaders of the clinic. The worker gave Niles an ultimatum. Niles was told that he would need to transfer units once again or be fired from his position and given three months of severance pay. If he accepted the transfer, he would be placed in the logistics unit that did nothing but help move patients from one place to another throughout the hospital and clinic. That way, potential lives weren't in danger. It doesn't seem like Niles liked either of these options. Soon after the conversation with the clinic leader, he began looking for a job elsewhere. Just a couple of weeks after the meeting with the leader of the clinic, Niles was given a very good reference letter by one of his superiors. In the letter, the superior explained that Niles was an incredible nurse that always went above and beyond what was expected of him. The letter acknowledged his devotedness and cooperative conduct as well, and even explained that every task he completed was to the utmost satisfaction. It seems that even though the clinic threatened to fire him, they didn't hold any ill will against him, or they really just wanted him to move on. It's difficult to know which way they were leaning. By December of that year, 2002, Niles had accepted a new job at the Delmanhorst Clinic. Unfortunately, his questionable behavior did not end when he left his former job. At his new clinic, the dark cloud would continue to linger over Niles and his clinic. As soon as he joined the new team, deaths rose to unprecedented levels. Fatalities began to rise and were occurring every time Niles was on duty. For the most part, these patients would be losing their lives due to arrhythmia or other blood and heart-related problems. Many of his new co-workers began to shy away from him, not wanting to become involved in whatever was going on around him. It seems that many of his superiors were suspicious of him as well, but none of them took a step forward and accused him of anything, as police would later find out in court proceedings. By all means, this was gross negligence on the part of the clinic as some of his co-workers had found four empty vials of agmaline while Niles was on duty one day, which causes life-threatening arrhythmia and heart-related problems. This information was taken to the leaders of the clinic, but they did nothing to stop him. A brief investigation into the matter proved that no doctors had prescribed that medication recently, and none of the patients had been taking that medication when the vials were found. All eyes were now on Niles, though it seemed like everyone around him was too scared to do anything about it. By June of 2005, police were finally beginning to close in on Niles. One of his co-workers had managed to catch him intentionally sabotaging a patient's medical pump. As the worker soon learned, he had been injecting it with agimaline, the same chemical he was suspected of three years prior. This incident was enough to finally get the police involved. So they showed up and began conducting an investigation. As you probably suspected, they found that Niles had been tampering with other patients throughout the years, and soon enough, the case began to explode. Police requested all of the death records and time cards for the previous two years, taking their investigation all the way back to 2003. It didn't take them long at all to begin connecting the dots and every trail they followed led back to Niles. The investigation would soon come to the conclusion that over the last two years, at least 73% of the deaths at this clinic could be connected to Niles in some way or another. Though it seems like the law works much differently in Germany than it does in other parts of the world. Even though this was definitely proven by investigators, there was still only a small penalty to be paid by Niles. Rather than being sentenced to prison for life, as he would have been if he lived in the United States, he was only facing five years behind bars and a temporary suspension of his nursing license. After being taken to trial with these allegations, he was found guilty in December of 2006. He was then taken away to prison to face his punishment. However, he wouldn't get off that easily. No sooner than his sentence was handed down, a team appealed his conviction. Soon enough, his conviction was reversed, but not the way you might be expecting. It wasn't reversed so as to release Niles from prison, Rather, it was reversed in exchange for a larger sentence. In the end, he was handed a seven and a half year sentence and his nursing license was to be permanently revoked.
By January of 2014, it was almost time for Niles to be released from prison. Police knew that he must have been involved in more crimes than he had been previously sentenced for. So they began working on getting to the bottom of every last death that occurred on Niles' watch. The local district attorney's office helped with the investigation and by September of 2014, Niles Hogel was suspected of at least three counts of murder, as well as two counts of attempted murder. It seems that at this point, Niles knew that the game was up and that he had been found out. He decided not to resist the charges and instead confessed. Though, he shocked the police with his confession. Not only did Niles accept involvement for taking the lives of three people and trying to take the lives of two others, but he added that he had claimed the lives of at least 30 others during this time. After investigating the issues even further, officers learned of 90 patients that had been poisoned by Niles. Of these 90 patients, about 60 were successfully resuscitated. However, the remaining 30 lost their lives. Just a few months after learning this, Niles Hogel was sentenced to life in prison. His sentence was finalized in March of 2015. The problem is that despite all of this, prosecutors still don't know the motive behind Niles' crimes. They suspect that he simply acted out of boredom and a sick desire to kill. However, others believe that he may have been trying to showcase how good he was at resuscitating someone. Though, this is nothing but speculation. You may be thinking that this is where the case begins to die down, but you'd be painfully wrong. Investigators still suspect that there was far more to this case than meets the eye, so they continued their investigations even further and kept digging into Niles' past, as well as the many deaths that took place at his various places of work. By October of 2014, they had learned that another 200 people had likely been victimized. Though, these weren't cases like they had investigated previously. Before, of the 90 people Niles had victimized, only 30 passed away. However, of the 200 cases they were now investigating, all 200 of them passed away, meaning there were likely hundreds of others who had been poisoned by Niles but simply didn't know about it. The case had grown to such a massive degree that the local police needed to create a special task force to investigate Niles' crimes, with the task force being dubbed Cardio, spelt with a K. The prosecutors knew that they needed to concrete evidence to help push these cases forward. To do this, they decided to exhume 134 of the victims that were linked to the cases. This task led them to visit 67 different cemeteries, but in most of these cases, the victims had decomposed far too much to be able to prove their allegations. In addition to these cases, a further 101 victims were suspected, but their bodies had been cremated, so there was no way to verify these accusations. Even more suspected victims were exhumed in 2015, and it was found that they had trace amounts of unprescribed heart medication in their blood. 37 other cases were opened in 2016, but it was around this time that police realized that their efforts were futile. No matter how many victims they managed to uncover, nothing was going to alter Niles' sentence. Thus, they began to take a step back on their investigative efforts and revealed to the public in 2017 that he was officially connected to around 90 cases, but that they suspected him of hundreds more. It was here that his case eventually died down while officers submitted their information to the courts awaiting a trial that was scheduled to take place in 2018 and 2019. In the end, 100 charges were placed against Niall at trial. Niles Hogel admitted to 43 of the cases on the first day of the trial. He claimed that he couldn't remember 52 of the victims, then denied any involvement in five of the remaining victims. As the trial finally came to a close, Niles Hogel was found guilty of 85 murders. Needless to say, he will be spending the rest of his life behind bars, but the impact of his actions still resonate through the community, and it seems like police may still be investigating some additional cases that could be placed against him in the coming years. From respected Dr. Niles Hogel to a highly respected colonel in the Royal Canadian Air Forces, Russell Williams, both share the desire to take innocent lives. The word camouflage means to hide or disguise the presence of a person, animal, or object. It's a tactic used mostly by military personnel to remain undetected by the enemy. But it could also be used for truly evil purposes by people you'd least expect. Russell Williams. How could a man 
The commander of one of the biggest Air Force bases in Canada, and a highly decorated colonel, with a career many describe simply as a shining bright star, become a cold-hearted killer, hiding in plain sight. Russell Williams was born on March 7, 1963, in Broomsgrove, England. Coming from a small family, his parents were David and Christine Williams, with Russell's little brother Harvey being born two years later. When Russell was five years old, the family became Canadian immigrants, moving to Chalk River, Ontario in 1968. Moving can be tough, especially when it's a new country, but the Williams didn't have to go through all that alone. They met the Solvkas, Jerry and Lynn, another married couple, and the two families became very close. A year later though, their happy tidings would come to an abrupt end. Russell's parents would file for divorce after David Williams was found cheating on Christine with Jerry Sobkus's wife, Lynn. However, Christine would then get remarried to Lynn's husband, Jerry. She changed her name to Noni Sobkus and moved with Russell and Harvey to a quiet neighborhood in Scarborough, Ontario. Russell was seven at the time and became known as Russell Savka. You might think that this may have been a moment of darkness for him, but by all accounts, Russell had a good childhood despite his parents' divorce. In fact, reports describe Russell as polite, well-behaved, and a shy child who then on went to become a young man that was self-disciplined, reliable, and very meticulous in his activities. As a teenager, Russ attended high school at Birchmount Collegiate Toronto. He ran a newspaper route, delivering mail and globe papers. Russell also trained in piano and trumpet. In 1979, his stepfather Jerry moved the family to South Korea where he had been employed to oversee a nuclear reactor project. Russ would move to Toronto in 1980 with his brother Harvey, completing the final two years of high school at Upper Canada College. While he was there, Russ was an exemplary student, excelling in drama, music, and sports, and was elected as a prefect. These are the times that foreshadowed the bright future for Russell. One where he would soon serve the country as Colonel of the Canadian Armed Forces. He went on to study economics and politics at the University of Toronto Scarborough. He even changed his last name back to his father's for an unexplained reason, once again becoming Russell Williams. He learned how to fly at a municipal airport while studying full-time whilst living in a basement apartment, alongside waiting tables at Red Lobster. Russell would enroll in the Canadian Forces in 1987, and by 1990, he had received his flying wings and moved to Manitoba, where he served as a flight instructor. The next year was big for Russell. He was promoted to captain and tied the knot with Mary Elizabeth Harriman, an applied science graduate from the University of Guelph. It was an intimate ceremony held in Winnipeg. Over the next decade, Williams' military career saw various changes in postings and promotions. In 1994, he would handle the transport of many important people, like dignitaries and government officials from other countries. In command of their flight, an officer on his way up in the Canadian Forces, Lieutenant Colonel Russell Williams. Over the next decade, he would obtain a Master of Defense Studies in 2004 from the Royal Military College with a thesis arguing on the issue of preemptive strikes in the Iraq War. By June of 2004, Russ was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel. His career would reach new heights in December of 2005 when he served as the commanding officer of a covert logistics facility in Dubai called Camp Mirage until May 2006. His return to Canada wasn't uneventful, 
With Williams battling chronic pain, he received various prescriptions, including prednisone, prescriptions that many who knew Williams said that they were the cause of his insomnia. Simultaneously, the Williams sold their home in Orleans, replacing it with a townhouse in Westboro Village, Ontario. Mary Elizabeth was now an Associate Executive Director of the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada. While they made sure to spend their weekends together, to golf and garden, Russell was yet again mostly alone, despite being a successful married man. Russell's handling of abandonment or loss had been described as intense by his friends and family, as seen when the couple's cat, 18-year-old Curio, had to be euthanized. It was a particularly painful event for Russell, putting him under distress. Even Russell mentioned the loss a couple of times during interrogations for his crimes. During his time in Quebec, during 2009, he received another promotion, this time making him Colonel. Now, Colonel Williams, as he was sworn in as Wing Commander for the Canadian Forces Base Trenton in July 2009. While Russell was transcending his competition career-wise, things would soon take a dark turn. Before 2007, Russell Williams was a decorated member of the Canadian military with no criminal records whatsoever. However, as they say, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. And so, in 2007, Russell began breaking into homes near him and his wife's home at Ottawa in 2008. According to reports and evidence, he would scope out his neighbors' homes, making sure that no one was there before entering to steal any female underwear he could find. He would also take personal items. On one occasion, he broke into a 12-year-old girl's home, spending almost three hours as he took pictures of himself in her underwear and clothing, or while he pleasured himself on her bed. Yeah, I bet you weren't expecting this when I mentioned he'd go on to commit crimes, huh? On another occasion, pictures he took showed him lying on a 15-year-old girl's bed while he pleasured himself as he held up a stuffed bear. Upon his arrest, other pictures were found, showing pictures of him kissing or licking underwear he had stolen. Some of them were stained with blood. There wasn't a search for a prowler in the neighborhood, though, because no one usually noticed their houses had been broken into. Williams even burglarized some of the houses on more than one occasion. Much of the evidence used to convict him in court was from his own stash of pictures, as though he were a scrapbooker taking mementos of his hobby. It also showed the progression of his crimes, from breaking in to dressing himself up in female underwear as part of his odd fetish, or frolicking nude in the bedrooms of young girls' rooms. He began to leave notes behind. On one occasion, he left a note saying, Malsi, on a girl's computer. Then, he moved on to leaving behind items that he used to please himself sexually. But this wasn't enough for Williams. He was just getting started. In July of 2009, he took off his clothes and pleasured himself as he watched an unsuspecting woman take a shower. Then, while she was in the bathroom, he entered her room through the window and stole her underwear. Williams would carry out about 62 successful B&Es before physically abusing women in September 2009. Russell Williams' first victim was a woman known to the public as Jane Doe. She was a testimony witness at Williams' trial. On September 17, 2009, she had fallen asleep with her infant at home in Tweed when a man identified as Williams broke into her house, binding, blindfolding, and fondling her. He undressed her, took pictures of her naked body, 
and was in her home for two hours before he left, promising that she and her baby would not be harmed. A few hours after this incident, Russell Williams was a member of the planning committee meeting for an upcoming charity event for the Criminal Intelligence Service of Ontario. It was as though he was two different people in one body. He would go on to assault Lori Massacott in her home just two weeks later. It was not the first time he had been in Lori's home, having been there many times before to steal some of her lingerie. Like the first victim, Lori had been asleep on the night of September 30th, 2009, and woke up to someone punching her in the head. Williams proceeded to blindfold and restrain Lori, forcing her to pose in pornographic manners as he took pictures of her. His intent seemed to be more focused on picture taking than it was on physically abusing her. At some point, Williams seemed to show some sort of remorse, apologizing to Lori for the punch to the head and allowed her to take some aspirin. Drops of water look little until they make up a puddle. Williams' drops of break-ins, trespassing, theft, and sexual assault piled up until they culminated in cold-blooded murder. On November 25, 2009, Williams took his twisted antics up a notch when he stalked and killed Marie-France Commune. She was 37 and was a military flight attendant based at the same base where Williams was a wing commander. Marie France had discovered Williams hiding in her basement at home. Startled, Williams attacked Commune, striking her repeatedly with a flashlight. Williams rendered her unconscious, wrapped her in duct tape, and for two hours, he went on to essay, torture, and torment Camus repeatedly. He also recorded Camus' ordeal on a video camera. All of her pleas and cries for help fell on deaf ears. After Williams was done satiating his evil, he placed duct tape over Camus' nose and watched her die slowly. He then cleaned up the scene of his evil deed and went back to the base as though nothing had happened. It seemed as though Williams' break-in and general criminal activity stopped after he brutally murdered Camus. His cooling period was short, however, and the following year, he would strike again. Jessica Lloyd was a 27-year-old living in Belleville, a community not too far from Tweed. On January 28, 2010, Jessica sent a text to a family friend before she presumably turned in for the night around 10.36 p.m. It was the last she was heard of, as she never turned up for work the next morning. Her family, anxious, reported her missing to the police, stating it was out of character for Jessica to not contact anyone about her whereabouts. Unknown to them, Williams had broken into Jessica's home that night, blindfolding her with duct tape and binding her with ropes. He took sexual advantage over Jessica for three hours and then took her to his cottage, continuing the torture for another 21 hours. He had promised Jessica he would not kill her, but he hit her with his flashlight and then he strangled her. Like he did with Marie, Williams documented Jessica's torture and death on photo and video. Leaving her body in the garage, he went back to work at the base. He returned to retrieve and dump the body elsewhere three days later. At the same time, the Belleville police and the general public were dedicating countless hours and efforts to locate Jessica. At Jessica's home, investigators had identified some unusual tire tracks that Williams had left behind in the snow. With this information, the Ontario Provincial Police searched all cars using the highway close to Jessica's home, looking for a match to the tracks they had found. Williams was one of the motorists in the search, and an officer noted that there was a match with his tire treads, 
Police placed Williams on immediate police surveillance. His tire treads were eventually matched to the evidence found outside Jessica's home. And when he was asked to report at the Ottawa Police Service headquarters for questioning on February 7, 2010, the interrogation lasted for 10 hours. And after he had been presented with all the incriminating evidence, he finally made a confession. He didn't just confess to Jessica's murder, he confessed to all of his many crimes. Williams gave detailed accounts of his crimes, including all of the tweed fetish break-ins and sexual abuse. He also showed police where his stash of evil was. Memorabilia from all of his crimes were carefully catalogued and hidden inside his Ottawa home and the Tweed Cottage. Finally, he pointed out the location where he had dumped Jessica's body on a map. On February 13, 2010, the Lloyd family held a funeral service for their daughter in Belleville. When Williams was asked why he had committed these crimes, he simply said, I don't know the answers. And I'm pretty sure the answers don't matter. Before his hearing, Williams tried to commit suicide and took on a hunger strike. Both attempts were unsuccessful, and he was placed under 24-hour suicide watch and solitary confinement. A grand total of 82 criminal code charges were filed against Russell Williams. He made his first appearance in court on October 7, 2010. On October 18, 2010, Russell Williams pleaded guilty to all the charges. On the first day and over the course of his trial, accounts of other crimes emerged. These include a mother who was attacked while she and her newborn were asleep in the house. It was also revealed that Williams possessed pedophiliac tendencies based on the number of underwear he had stolen belonging to girls as young as nine. Williams' total number of home invasions and break-ins between September 2007 and November 2009 was rounded up at 82. The prosecution revealed that Williams even kept tabs on police reports of his crimes. He had a system for his crimes logging and documenting details about how they went down, like a shopkeeper doing inventory. Some of the evidence, such as photos of Williams wearing the underwear he had stolen, was released to the press and published in papers. On October 19, 2010, Williams was found guilty of all charges filed against him. Three days later, he was sentenced to two concurrent life terms. Some accounts hold that Williams seemed to show remorse for his actions. He wrote letters by hand to the parents of Jessica Lloyd and Marie France Camus, as well as his wife regretting the shame he had put her through and asking her to take care of their cat Rosie. Marie Elizabeth filed for divorce from him in 2010 and their marriage was annulled in 2014. Initially imprisoned at Kingston Penitentiary, Russell Williams is now incarcerated at Port Carrier Institution in Quebec after Kingston was closed down. In an exorcism of sorts, Williams' uniform was burnt by the Canadian forces. All of his medals and awards were revoked. Although Williams was not technically a serial killer, committing just two murders, he is regarded as one, as he would have surely killed again if he hadn't been caught. Trusted Russian police officer, Mikhail Popkov claimed the lives of at least 78 women throughout his murderous reign. It is becoming increasingly normal for people with the most social skills and upbeat personalities to be the ones with the biggest secrets to hide. Today's case focuses on one of such people, a friendly neighborhood cop who ended up committing such disastrous crimes and the worst part is, he probably wouldn't have stopped if he had not been arrested. Born on the 7th of March, 1964, in the cold town of Nariska in Krasnyask, region of northern Russia, Mikhail seemingly had a normal childhood. 
In truth, not much is known about his childhood and upbringing, except that at some point in his childhood, his family moved from Naryuska to the Russian city of Angarsk. Popkov had a pretty decent educational background, having attended the local public school in the city. However, he did not attend university. Having an interest in the military, Popkov opted for joining the police force instead, working as a regional police officer in the Irkutsk region of Russia. He was in the force for several years before meeting his wife, Alina Popkov, who was also a police officer. The lovebirds got married not too long after meeting and soon had a daughter named E. Katrina. Soon after having his daughter, Popkov resigned from the police force to work as a security guard at the Angarsk Oil and Chemical Company, which offered to pay better than the police force did. After a few years with the oil company, Popkov switched employers again, this time opting to work for a private firm instead. For the most part, Mikhail appeared as the perfect husband and father. He was often seen spending time with his daughter and was reportedly very devoted to his wife. But how did this seemingly normal man become a predatory killer with absolutely no remorse for his crimes? Well, according to Popkov himself, his killing rage was motivated by the women in his life being unfaithful and immoral. He didn't go into much detail on the subject, but he hinted that the fact that his mother constantly cheated on his father and was unfaithful for much of her marriage. He also hinted that his mother was a raging alcoholic who would often abuse him whenever she went on a bender. This feeling of betrayal only compounded years later when he was married and began suspecting his wife of cheating on him. His response to this feeling of intense betrayal wasn't picking up a habit like drinking or simply confronting his wife. Instead, he chose to go into a murderous rage that saw him kill dozens of young innocent women. Beginning sometime in 1992, when he was still in the police force, Popkov started his rampage of killing young women who he described as immoral and not innocent. He confessed to having a strange feeling of detest and rage directed at women who drank or simply any woman who dressed indecently coming out of a bar or club. He would normally go on patrols in his squad car and would pass by clubs and bars. There, he would see these immoral women freely flaunting their immorality. According to him, he initially fought the urge to harm any of these women, as he was also a father and husband. But apparently one day, the urges got the best of him. Popkov's first murder was a young woman who he picked up in his patrol car. According to him, when he picked her up in front of the bar, he had no intention of harming her, only wanting to give her a ride home as she appeared intoxicated. But as he later told police, he just had an overwhelming urge to kill this woman sitting next to him. Finally, giving in to his depraved desire, Popkov drove the car over to an abandoned road, stating that the woman was even too drunk to notice. He proceeded to strangle her in his car till she was blue in the face and stopped breathing. He then proceeded to take sexual advantage of her lifeless body several times. He described the feeling he got as liberating and heavenly. After killing the young woman, he disposed of her body easily by burying her in a shallow grave knowing fully well that the thick Russian snow would cover the body even further. After his first kill, Popkov said he just couldn't stop and began planning better ways to commit these murders. He would take murder weapons from the police evidence locker, including hammers, ropes, and knives to use in killing his victims, and would wipe off his fingerprints before disposing of them. Popkov reportedly had a type when it came to his choice of victim and was very particular about this when making a decision. Police revealed that most of his victims were average height, full-figured, with strikingly similar features to his mother. He killed dozens of women. Mikhail's reign of terror continued for several years, even after he left the force. His MO of picking up intoxicated women from bars and clubs did not change much over the years, but his mode of murder got more brutal and vicious. In one case, Popkov cut off his victim's head and still took sexual advantage of the corpse. In another case, he cut out the heart of his victim, tossing it beside the body for no apparent reason other than sheer evil. 
He would kill with all sorts of items, including knives, screwdrivers, slip knots, and even an axe, which police revealed he used up to 17 times on different occasions. Popkov was determined to continue his murderous spree for as long as he could, with his reign of terror spread in the 1990s, and it wasn't just limited to his city of Angars, but also other neighboring towns, which he frequently visited after leaving the police. Despite the fact that he had left the force, Mikhail kept using his police uniform when picking up his victims, as he came across as a trusting police officer which was why most of his victims entered his car without much of a second thought. He was charming, charismatic, and sociable, making women trust him without a second thought. But bodies were piling up all over the city and even neighboring towns, and the police were clueless as to who the killer was. The police received widespread criticism for failing to catch Popkov, who was dubbed the Wednesday Killer, because the body of his victims were commonly discovered on Wednesday mornings. The criticism was because the police were working on the vital evidence like the kinds of murder weapons used and the fact that his DNA was indeed found in the body of some of the victims who he had intercourse with post-mortem. Mikhail continued killing into the late 1990s, but his luck almost ran out when one of his victims survived. On January 26, 1998, in an attempt to score another victim, Popkov drove up to 15-year-old Svetlana in front of a public bench and offered to give her a ride home. Svetlana would later reveal that the only reason she got in his car was the fact that he was dressed in a policeman's uniform and he had a police car. After a few minutes of driving, Svetlana revealed that Popkov stopped the car in a wooded area that she didn't recognize because it was dark. He then asked her to get out of the car, which she thought was odd, but did it anyway because, after all, he was a police officer. Popkov told her to take off her clothes, which she did initially refuse to do, but she later complied after realizing he wasn't joking and she got scared. After she was completely undressed, Popkov reportedly hit her head on a tree, causing her to fall unconscious. Popkov then took advantage of the unconscious teenager and left her dead, thinking there was no way she could survive. But as fate would have it, she did, waking up the next morning with a bleeding head. Doctors said that she was lucky to be alive, not just because of the violence she endured, but because she survived stark naked in minus 13 degree weather. Young Svetlana had told anyone who would listen that her perpetrator was a police officer, but the police were still reluctant to open an official investigation into the case. It took constant badgering and complaints from Svetlana's mother before the police finally opened the investigation. Svetlana narrated the story to the police, telling them her attempted killer was a police officer. This was where it gets a little bit tricky. After police brought pictures of present and past officers on the force, Svetlana was able to identify Popkov and his car with pinpoint accuracy and surety. But it turned out that having one of their own up for attempted murder wasn't something the Angarsk police force loved to do. Upon investigation, Popkos's wife Elena, who is still on the police force, provided an alibi for her husband, stating that she was with him during the time of the rape and attempted murder. This wasn't the first time suspicion had landed on Popkov, as he was identified by another person years earlier, who had seen him pick up a woman at a bar, and the woman turned up dead the next day. It was discovered that the victim had syphilis, meaning her perpetrator could have contracted the same STI. Upon testing Popkov, it turned out that he was positive for syphilis, which should have been enough to arrest him at least. But in this same case, Popkov's wife Elena provided another alibi for her husband, and the police preferred to take the word of their own over evidence. Many argued that the police intentionally botched the investigation into Popkov after Svetlana's testimony because as much as they wanted to catch the killer themselves, they didn't want it to be a police officer. After Svetlana's testimony, Popkov became more careful but continued his murderous rampage all the same. His next high-profile killing would be Tatiana Martinova and her friend Yulia Kuprikova. Tatiana, who was only 20 at the time, was married with a baby. 
She decided to attend a concert one night after her big sister Victoria offered her tickets to attend the concert. Tatiana's husband was against her going, but she reassured him, telling him that she was attending with a friend Yulia, who was 29 at the time. After the concert, Yulia and Tatiana went out with a few friends for drinks, and on their way out of the restaurant, they were offered a lift by a policeman in the police car. On the morning of the 29th of October, Tatiana's husband called her sister, stating that his wife had not returned home from the previous night. The distressed husband said he thought that she had spent the night at her friend Yulia's house, but he called to check and Yulia's mother said that she had not returned home either. Both Tatiana's sister Victoria and her husband went to the police to report the missing, but they were told that they had to wait three days before a missing persons report could be filed. Meanwhile, that same morning, the bodies of both women were discovered in the next town. Tatiana's body was cut up badly, while Yulia's face was viciously disfigured with a screwdriver. Both women were taken sexual advantage of before and after they were killed and left naked by the side of the field. Years later, when Popkov would be arrested and his face splashed all over the news, Victoria realized she knew the man who murdered her sister. It turned out that both Victoria and Popkov had been involved in a biathlon together years ago, and that she would describe him as a tall, lean, quiet man who rarely spoke and only watched. Popkov seemingly committed his crimes under the radar for almost two decades until technology and strategy finally caught up with him. The federal police stepped into the case sometime in the late 2000s, and seeing how the police had previously established that the killer was indeed a police officer, they decided to compare the DNA found on all of the recovered victims to that of over 3,500 police officers in the Angarsk area and neighboring towns as well. After successfully getting Popkov's DNA, which was an obvious match to those found on the victims, he was arrested on the 23rd of June 2012, 22 years after his initial murder. He surprisingly cooperated with the investigators, giving them every detail of every murder, even taking them to the scene of the crimes. Mikhail Popkov was charged with the murder of 29 women, the majority of whom were under 25, and others between the ages of 25 and 40, all in the Angarsk of northern Russia. He was convicted and found guilty of 22 murders between 1992 and 2012 and was sentenced to life in prison with no hope of parole. Two years into his sentence, Popkov confessed to an additional 59 victims, making him one of the most prolific serial killers in Russian history. He was then convicted of an additional 56 murders and was given a second life sentence. As if those weren't enough, he confessed to an additional two murders in July of 2020 making a total of 83 confessed killings in his lifetime. Mikhail Popkov was a social beast who played those around him so well that they vouched for him when he was first accused. But his true nature as a murderous animal came to light soon enough. Definitely our craziest case ever covered on this channel. Cayetano Santos Godino, the nine-year-old serial killer. At the unbelievable age of just nine years old, Cayetano Godino became the youngest confirmed serial killer in world history, after having taken the lives of multiple children in the early 1900s. This savage criminal was just nine years old when he took his first life, burying his victim alive in a shallow grave. The details of his crimes only get worse from here, as he remained undetected until his later teenage years. So, with that said, Buckle up, because this is going to be a wild one. Cayetano Gadino was born in Buenos Aires in Argentina on the 31st of October, 1896. He was born into a relatively large family, having a total of seven siblings, meaning he lived in a small family home with 10 other people. Throughout his childhood, it doesn't seem like Cayetano ever got the attention he deserved. Living with such a large family can be pretty difficult and can lead you to feeling quite isolated sometimes. This definitely seems to be the case with Cayetano. 
His older brothers were always picking on him for his small stature and large ears. In fact, as he grew older, he became known as Patiso Oriudo, which translates to Big Eared Midget. It's very easy to see how some of the trauma he endured in his early years could have led him to becoming such a vicious person as he grew older. To make matters worse, his father was a raging alcoholic. His parents immigrated to the capital city of Argentina, Buenos Aires, after escaping poverty in southern Italy, Calabria. Around this time, his parents had also been struggling to come to terms with the death of their 10-month-old son, who passed away from an unexpected cardiac illness. Rather than face his problems head-on, it seems like Cayetanos' father turned to alcohol to numb his pain. However, the pain he tried so hard to cover up would frequently be transferred to others, as the man was known to become very violent when he drank. Now, I'm no doctor, but it seems like these fits of rage are likely attributed to Cayetano's poor decisions later in life, both physically and mentally. What's incredibly sad about this case is that we know that Cayetano was subject to abuse at the hands of both his brother and his father. When his father would drink, he would beat his children and his wife, leaving them on the brink of death on multiple occasions. It seems like the man's children picked up on his bad behavior, as Cayetano's brothers would also beat him regularly. When Cayetano was examined by a doctor later in life, the doctor discovered that the boy had at least 27 scars on his head alone. Cayetano claimed that each of these scars either came from his brother or his father both of whom would repeatedly beat him in the head. Though, this wasn't the end of Cayetano's misfortune. We know that Cayetano's father was a guitar player, and rumors have circulated that he contracted syphilis from one of his fans. This information hasn't been verified, but we do know for sure that Cayetano's father did, in fact, have syphilis before Cayetano was born. This means that he passed the illness on to Cayetano's mother and, in turn, it's believed that Cayetano was given the illness as well. This led to some serious health complications when Cayetano was very young, leading him to be in and out of the hospital frequently during his childhood years. At one point, we know that Cayetano grew sick with enteritis. This illness is often caused by living or eating in very unsanitary conditions. Cayetano finally began going to school when he was five years old. However, his parents had a difficult time keeping him in school, as he was frequently getting expelled. It seemed like he showed no interest whatsoever in his schoolwork, and his parents were unable to get him to pay attention while he was away from home. Throughout his school years, none of his teachers were able to help him learn how to read. Instead, he would often wander off from the school building and play around his neighborhood, looking for something evil to do. It seems that, for the most part, the people who saw him during this time paid very little attention. This is where his evil desires truly began to emerge. In September of 1804, Cayetano decided to release his anger toward a young boy who lived nearby. He managed to gain the trust of two-year-old Miguel de Pauli. He promised the young boy candy if he would follow him into the nearby desert. Being a naive two-year-old, the boy happily agreed to follow, and soon enough, the two found themselves far away from any adults. Once they arrived at the location that he had planned out, Cayetano began to beat the boy. Cayetano would have been about eight years old at the time, meaning he was much larger than the two-year-old he was fighting against. At the end of the scruffle, Cayetano pushed the boy into a nearby ditch, causing him to land on a pile of thorny branches. Thankfully, a police officer happened to be patrolling the area nearby and saw what Cayetano had done. You may be thinking that the officer swooped in to save the day, right? Well, you couldn't be further from the truth. The man certainly stepped in and broke up the fight, but he didn't do anything to Cayetano. Instead, he just drove the two kids to the police station and asked them to wait for their mothers to come and pick them up. Cayetano was not punished for what he had done and 
was simply released, giving him the perfect opportunity to strike again. Not long afterward, Cayetano began picking fights again, though it would be difficult to call these outbursts of anger a fight, as they were more often than not just one-sided assaults. This time, Cayetano began picking on an 18-month-old little boy, luring the little boy to a secluded area with the promise of candy. The little boy agreed, but once they had arrived, Cayetano began beating him in the head with a rock. It doesn't seem like the boy ever fought back, and once again, a police officer witnessed the entire ordeal. The officer swooped in and pulled the two away from one another, but once again, Cayetano was set free without any punishment. The officer and Cayetano's father claimed that it was just a fight between two boys and there was nothing serious to be worried about. This is where Cayetano's crimes take a major turn for the worse, leading the young boy to take the life of his first victim. In 1906, Cayetano committed his first of many murders at nine years old. He confessed this crime to police officers many years after it had taken place, and it's very likely that officers would have never found him responsible if he had not confessed. Maria Rosa Face was about three years old at the time of the crime. Cayetano admitted that he lured the girl, once again, to a nearby deserted area. Once the two arrived there, he began to attack her in the same way he had attacked the other boys. However, this time, he didn't get stopped by a policeman. The two were located on Rio de Janeiro Street when Cayetano began to strangle the little girl. He did his best to claim her life this way, but he wasn't able to seal the deal. Instead, he continued to beat the girl and then tossed her into a nearby ditch that had been filled with trash. Sources vary about the details of what happened next, but it seems that Cayetano dug a makeshift grave in the ditch, placed the girl inside, then covered her up with cans. She was alive when she was buried. The young girl would never be found, but her parents did their best to search for her in the days after her disappearance. In the end, unable to cope with the disappearance of their daughter, her parents moved back to Italy a short while later hoping to put the situation behind them. After Cayetano revealed his crimes to police many years later, officers would return to the scene of the crime in hopes they would be able to find the little girl's remains and put the case to rest once and for all. However, when they arrived, they found that a two-story home had since been built in the area. This meant that officers had no way of searching for the girl's remains without demolishing the home. The homeowners didn't allow law enforcement to destroy their property and the house was left unharmed. To this day, the house remains on top of the girl's resting place and police have made no attempts to retrieve the young girl's body. Cayetano's next crime would be less violent than his previous crimes. However, it would be the first crime that he would receive prison time for. When Cayetano was 10 years old, his mother caught him in the act of pleasuring himself. At the time, this act was highly illegal and would often lead to prison time. He was arrested after his mother called police and he was placed in jail for two months as a result. Though, when he returned home, he was no better off than when he had left. Many things happened in Cayetano's life around this time. Just days after the death of the young girl, Cayetano's father found the remains of the family's pet bird in a shoebox. The bird's eyes had been removed and the box was lying beside the father's bed. Cayetano's father knew which of his sons had carried out this cruel deed and went to the police, begging for them to do something. It's unknown if he received punishment by law for this deed. A couple years later, Cayetano would strike again when he lured a young boy to an abandoned warehouse. Cayetano grabbed the boy and tried to drown him in a nearby trough. Thankfully, the building's owner heard the commotion that was taking place and ran outside to see what was going on. Believe it or not, Cayetano managed to convince the man that he had not been trying to drown the young boy. Instead, Cayetano claimed that he had just witnessed a mysterious woman in black who emerged from the shadows and tried to take the life of the boy. As crazy as this obviously sounds, both the police and the landowner believed him. 
They even went as far as to conduct an official investigation into this woman in black. But obviously nothing was ever found. A few months after this, Cayetano was scolded once again after he burned the eyelids of an infant with a cigarette butt. He managed to run away from the scene of the crime before the infant's mother could identify him. At this point, you're probably thinking enough is enough. Surely the boy wouldn't get into any more trouble after this, would he? Well, you'd be wrong. In fact, things were really beginning to heat up for Cayetano in a very real way. On January 17th, 1912, Cayetano would have been in his early teens. It was at this time he decided to set fire to a warehouse in his hometown. Due to witnesses that day, police knew immediately that Cayetano was the one who had set the fire. When he was interviewed about his attempt at arson, all he told officers was, I like to see firemen working. It's nice to see how they fall into the fire. Next up on his list of victims would be a 13-year-old boy named Arturo Lorora. This young boy was found in an abandoned building after he had been whipped repeatedly with a branch from a nearby fig tree. As it would turn out, Cayetano had taken the boy's life by strangling him after beating him for hours on end. Police would not learn that Cayetano was behind the crime until many years later. The crimes of Cayetano don't stop there, and the truth is, we could just keep going on and on about Cayetano's crimes. Though, I'd like to tell you the story of one final crime that Cayetano carried out before we start diving into how this vicious criminal was finally put behind bars. A five-year-old girl was admiring a pair of shoes from a clothing store window. She was just outside of the store, peering in through the glass. As she stood there, she was wearing one of her favorite dresses. Cayetano snuck up from behind her and set her dress on fire as she stood there. It only took a few seconds for the girl to become shouting out in pain and fear. Her grandfather was across the street and immediately jumped into action to try to save his little girl. He ran across traffic to try and help her, but he was immediately struck by a vehicle and passed away at the scene. A police officer who was nearby noticed what was going on and threw himself on top of the young girl, trying to stifle the blaze. The girl was taken to the nearby emergency hospital and treated for severe burns. Sadly, she would not be able to recover from the incident and she passed away 16 days later. Police had no idea who had set the blaze, meaning Cayetano got away with his crime once again. When police discovered the body of Cayetano's victim, a three-year-old boy, he was arrested within 24 hours. After locals reported seeing the teen lurking around the area where his final victim would eventually be found, officers considered him to be their prime suspect. He was taken into police custody while awaiting trial and confessed to all of his crimes. It seems like he knew his vicious game had finally come to an end and was willing to help police put many of these once cold cases to rest. He openly spoke about his crimes with officers, seeming to show no remorse for his victims. In the end, Cayetano Santos Godino is believed to have claimed the lives of four people, assaulted two others, and attempted to claim the lives of five more. All of this took place between 1906 and 1912, with Cayetano being considered Argentina's very first serial killer. By January of 1913, Cayetano was ordered to go to a reformatory. While here, he tried to take the lives of several inmates. After mental health professionals concluded that he was legally insane, a judge decided to put Cayetano's case to rest and released him from all charges. However, he ordered him to remain in the reformatory, presumably for the rest of his life. Though, we don't really know for sure. By November of 1915, an appeal forced Cayetano to be sent to jail. In March of 1923, Cayetano was transferred to a prison in Asuya. While here, he took the lives of two pet cats that belonged to prisoners. Because of this, the prisoners beat him within inches of his life, sending him to the hospital. Shortly afterward, Cayetano grew very ill. 
He would remain in the hospital for over a decade until 1944 when he passed away under mysterious circumstances at the age of 48. The reason behind his death was never determined and it doesn't seem like investigating officers have any interest in finding out who was responsible for taking this violent man's life. Another strange case, Pedro Rodriguez Fiu, with 71 confirmed victims. This man is now a free man. Let's face it, the world is a cruel, crime-filled place. To try to combat this, there are several laws put in place in an attempt to keep order and justice. For Pedro Rodriguez, who has been dubbed the Brazilian Dexter, the punishment for some were not severe enough. After being caught for several murders, including that of his own father, Pedro went on to commit the majority of his killings within jail, brutally taking the lives of those he believed to deserve the ultimate sentence. But what makes a man who can kill his own father turn into a vigilante who targets the worst of society? Was this his own sick way of validating murder? From the day he was born, Pedro grew up in a violent home. He was born in the state of Minas Gerais, Brazil, on June 17, 1954, and often found himself on the receiving end of his father's cruelty. In fact, Pedro got his first beating while still in his mother's womb, after he abused her while pregnant. This resulted in Pedro being born with a deformed and damaged skull. Growing up in this toxic and violent environment made Pedro come to believe that being evil was fun, which eventually came to a boiling point when he was just 13. After an argument with his cousin, the teen pushed the older man into a sugarcane press, almost killing him. A year later, Pedro's father was working as a school guard. One day his father returned home, claiming that the deputy mayor of Alphanus had accused him of stealing food from the canteen. I think this means that he may have eaten a burger or two without pain, opposed to being caught with sloppy joes stuffed in his pockets. Pedro didn't like the idea of his father wrongfully losing his job and decided to do something about it. Taking a gun, Pedro shot the deputy mayor in cold blood and then shot another school guard he believed was the real food thief. When the doctor says eating too much junk food can kill you, I don't think he meant it this way. After the murders, the young teen fled to Moji Das Cruises, where he raided drug dens and killed sex traffickers. While cleaning up the streets in his own messed up way, he met a young woman named Maria Olympia, who he soon fell in love with and got engaged to. Not long after that, she would fall pregnant. Now, this could be the perfect ending, right? The killer who tried to make amends for killing a deputy mayor and guard by picking off drug dealers and human traffickers settled down with a wife and baby? Well, unfortunately, we don't do happily ever after endings here on Twisted Minds, and things are about to get much worse. Although Pedro had fallen in love, things weren't peaches and cream. In fact, Maria, who is part of a gang, would ask Pedro to track down and kill enemy gang members. The things we do for love, right? After the targets were hit, the streak of violence against drug gangs slowed down, but they had not forgotten about what the couple had done. One of the drug dealers eventually put a hit out on Maria, killing both her and the unborn baby. This forced an 18-year-old Pedro into hiding again, heartbroken, alone, and seeking revenge. Pedro began torturing drug dealers and gangsters for information, like some sort of cliche movie. He eventually found out the gang leader was responsible and launched a daring attack on a wedding party. If the bride was hoping for a white wedding, she was out of luck. Once Pedro and his gang were done, seven of the gang members were dead, with a further 16 wounded. Surprisingly, the police at the time did not really make any efforts to catch him as they saw him as a visual ante cleaning up the streets. These are the poverty-ridden streets of Brazil we're talking about here. In most cases, Pedro targeted all kinds of criminals, 
finding them by looking up their names and addresses before brutally killing them in a variety of ways. Although he would try any method at least once, his favorite way of murdering people was stabbing them to death or hacking them apart with blades. When confronting robber Juan de Costa, he crushed his skull with a blunt weapon, whereas one of his unnamed fellow inmates was decapitated with a knife. In an interview, he stated that if he heard of a crime, he would be spurred on to find and kill the person responsible. Sometimes he would capture criminals and torture them to death whenever he needed to get out some anger, rather than clean up the streets. Months after the wedding massacre, Pedro discovered that his favorite cousin's boyfriend had got her pregnant but refused to marry her. This didn't go down well with the serial killer, I mean vigilante, who didn't hesitate in shooting the man out of anger. As Pedro was going around killing drug gangs, he didn't realize that things at home had gotten even worse. One night in a drunken rage, his father brutally killed his mother with a machete. As soon as Pedro heard the gruesome news, he did what he did best at. In May 1973, he headed to the jail where his father was being kept, waited till visiting hours, and stabbed him 22 times right in front of the shocked guards and other prisoners. To make things even more gruesome, he cut out his father's heart and took a bite out of it like it was a jam-filled donut. This obviously led to his arrest, and according to news sources, he even managed to kill another prisoner while being transported to another facility after finding out the man was incarcerated for taking advantage of young girls. Pedro, who was found guilty and sentenced to 126 years, was sent to one of the most brutal prisons in Brazil, where he immediately proved himself to be among the most ruthless of killers. Within the constraints of the prison, he appointed himself the judge, jury, and executioner of the most evil criminals being held at the prison. He would often torture his victims with whatever weapon he could fashion, often forced to get inventive with his ways of torturing them. His favorite targets were pedophiles and drug dealers. Word got out around the prison that Pedro was a killer who liked to kill other criminals, which caused many of the prisoners, who you have to remember were some of the toughest and worst men around, to be absolutely terrified of him. When a prison gang tried to take him out, it was reported that out of the five men who attacked him on the yard, only two managed to run away with their lives. After that, no one tried to take him out again. For the crimes committed behind bars, he was sentenced to an increased 400 years, but due to some legal loopholes, Pedro was set for a 2003 release date. Police did manage to stick an extra four years on him for bad behavior, but in 2007, Pedro was finally free, despite killing 47 people while behind bars. You may be asking yourself, how can he be freed after killing so many people? Well. Brazil has a law that means a criminal cannot spend more than 40 years in prison. Yep, you heard that right. The only time a life sentence can be carried out is for military crimes committed during wartime. Pedro has since become something of a phenomenon for his survival in the harshest regime of a Brazilian prison. As on average, a prisoner will live up to 15 years in prison before being killed by disease or other prisoners. Although this may sound awful, this environment is still rife throughout Brazilian prisons, especially those holding the worst of the worst. After spending 34 years behind bars, Pedro was freed in 2007 and moved to Fortaleza in the Brazilian state of Sierra. However, his past crimes would soon catch up with him, and he was arrested again in 2011 on new accusations of starting riots and false imprisonment. Police arrested the killer at his new rural home, and he spent a further eight years in prison. This time around, he kept his killer instinct to himself to prevent spending more time than necessary in a cell. While in prison this time, he sent letters to his new girlfriend, who is also serving time for theft. After his release in 2008, Pedro boasted about killing over 100 people, but stressed that they were all bad people who did bad things. In fact, he even went as far as to say that he had done society a favor by killing the scums. The killer now says he is sorry for his crimes and has since converted to Christianity. He has also written an autobiography where he openly talks about his violent past. Bizarrely, 
Pedro has since started his own YouTube channel, where he posts clips of interviews and talks about his murderous spree. He has currently amassed a subscriber count of 252,000, with hundreds of people commenting on his videos every day. Can we take a minute to just take that in? One of the worst and notorious serial killers of the 70s now has his own YouTube channel. Don't forget to hit those like and subscribe buttons. It would be criminal if you didn't. And you know what I like to do to criminals. Behind the YouTube channel is a 30-year-old man called Pablo Silva, who is a YouTuber himself and a longtime friend of the serial killer. He is the one who sets up the video subjects as well as doing other tasks to help Pedro out. For example, he buys him clothes and takes him to church. When asked why he helped get Pedro on YouTube, Pablo said, I had this idea of showing the positive side of Pedro, which many people didn't know. I didn't imagine it would get this far. Pedro Rodriguez Fijo has been described as a psychopath and fits most of the criteria according to psychologists, as he displays a lack of remorse and compassion for those he has brutally killed. With that being said, where Pedro differs is his genuine love for his mother, relatives, and girlfriend, which doesn't completely land him in that category. He was analyzed by psychologists in 1982 and was diagnosed as a paranoid and antisocial character with an overwhelming impulse to act out his own version of justice. It's easy to see the beginning for this serial killer, growing up in a violent and abusive environment. From a young age, he was taught that the way to keep control of a situation or gain power was to be the most violent person in the room. It was this power he got addicted to, and instead of gaining power the same way his father did, by abusing women, he killed off people he thought deserved to die, in a warped form of protection. How could he feel bad about what he had done when he was only doing it to protect others, right? Also, it's clear that Pedro often acted out of emotion. When his father was fired for stealing, he lashed out. When the gang members killed his fiancée, he lashed out. And when his father killed his mother, he lashed out. It's clear that Pedro was a product of his upbringing, and that his intent to protect others stemmed from the abuse he saw his mother go through at the hands of his father. In fact, Pedro was reminded of this abuse every single time he looked in the mirror, as his deformed skull could clearly be seen. Something that was a result of a man beating his pregnant wife. Absolutely despicable. A disturbing fact, especially considering that he is now free, is that Pedro Rodriguez lands sixth in the list of serial killers with the most confirmed kills. At 71 proven kills, it means that he would have had to have killed multiple people a year from the time of his first kill in 1968. Since leaving prison, the 67-year-old serial killer has supposedly changed his ways, reaching out to troubled youths in order to keep them away from a life of crime and violence. To some people, Pedro is a hero, and to others, he is no better than the criminals he kills. Despite which side of the fence you stand at, one thing we can all agree on is that the legacy of Pedro Rodriguez Fijo will live on for many years to come. For those who believe that Pedro solely wanted to make the world a better place by taking out the trash, it is worth knowing that he has a tattoo on his left arm that says, I kill for pleasure. The question is, can a man with 71 confirmed kills and admitting to over 100 really be a changed man? He wanders the streets like everybody else, but more frighteningly, is amassing a huge amount of followers holding on to every last word. While Pedro may be glorified by many today, these two teenage brothers are resented by most. Just take a look at their horrific acts. At some point in everyone's life, we all went through a phase of rebellion against our parents. Whether it is dyeing your hair, getting a cheeky tattoo of some obscure cartoon character you once loved, or maybe sticking it to the man by sticking up the middle finger to a teacher. Well, today's story is probably one of the most extreme examples of rebelling against parents, resulting in the tragic loss of many lives. Welcome or welcome back to Twisted Minds. My name is James, and today we take a look at the case of the Freeman family murders. A tale of a religious family that got torn apart by neo-Nazi radicalization and an incredible level of cruelty and violence. Mm -hmm. 
Married couple Dennis and Brenda Freeman lived an ordinary life in Lehigh County, Pennsylvania. Dennis worked as a janitor at a local high school, working all the hours he could to provide for his family, who were brought up deeply religious as Jehovah's Witnesses. Bringing up their three sons in the quiet town was heaven for the couple. That is, until the two oldest, 17-year-old Brian and 16-year-old David, began to act and dress differently. Now, that's not a surprising thing for a teenager to do, as they join a culture or group on their journey of discovering and expressing themselves. The problem with the Freeman case, however, was that the two boys had adopted the lifestyle and ideology of neo-Nazism, a group that promotes hatred and white supremacy. In short, they became supporters of a long dead regime. As the two brothers immersed themselves more and more into the group, they shaved their heads, wore military uniforms, tattooed the infamous swastika onto their necks, and began drinking more, which fueled their violent tempers. To take things even further, the teenagers decided to get tattoos on their foreheads, with Brian saying Berserker and David's saying Sag Hail. As you can imagine, family life was rocked by these two teens terrorizing their house with their drunken behavior and extremist views. In fact, Brenda often called counselors and begged them for advice, none of which helped the Freeman family home. At one point, she managed to convince Brian and David to attend an anti-skinhead education class that was run by the police, but ultimately, it didn't work. Following a number of incidences where the two boys got blackout drunk, took drugs, or hurt others, Brian ended up being admitted to the hospital for mental illness, while David ended up in several juvenile facilities. Despite months of being detained in facilities and being treated for substance abuse, they always ended up back at the family home, to the horror of Dennis, Brenda, and their middle son, Eric. To give you an insight into how bad things were, the Salisbury police had to visit the house five times between 1993 and 1995, with Brian threatening to kill his parents over an argument about the family car. It wasn't just the police that the two teens had problems with, as they were often skating on thin ice at school over violent outbreaks, racist remarks, and bullying. The last in a long string of violence the teens were involved in was the drawing of a racist doodle in a textbook which resulted in Brian getting suspended from Salisbury High School. Although that is a pretty despicable thing to do, it was nothing compared to the crimes the Freeman boys were about to commit inside their own family home. Valerie Freeman, the sister and sister-in-law of David and Brian's parents, knew too well of the cruelty of the brothers. For example, they would pee in her shampoo as a prank, as well as leave chicken bones in her bed. As things escalated and their father lost control of the household, he suggested that his sister should move out to make the situation better for her. Not wanting to stick around for things to get worse and cruelty in their pranks to grow, Valerie decided to leave the house. Despite now being able to sleep in a more peaceful home, not to mention getting rid of the funky smell of her hair, she was worried for her favorite nephew, Eric. You see, Eric was the one who suffered the most, as his brothers treated him really badly. They felt that the younger boy was nothing more than a butt kisser who was spoiled by their parents. David and Brian would pick on Eric mercilessly, teasing him for his religious beliefs and devotion to being a Jehovah's Witness. Eric was smaller than his brothers, and despite hoping he would have protection through his faith, sadly, there was nothing that could protect him from his loutish, hateful brothers. On February 26th, after visiting the movies, Brian and David Freeman, along with their 18-year-old cousin, Ben Birdwell, all returned to the family home. Unfortunately, their mother, Brenda Freeman, had a problem with the cousin, which resulted in a huge argument breaking out in the home. As tensions rose, Brenda decided to step away from the boys. As she came down the stairs, however, Brian grabbed a hold of his mother and forcefully wedged a pair of shorts in her mouth before repeatedly stabbing her with a steak knife until the 48-year-old died. This had awoken something in the brothers and their cousin, 
as David and Birdwell entered the bedroom where Dennis Freeman was sleeping. With one armed with a metal exercise bar and the other holding an aluminum baseball bat, Dennis Freeman was beaten to death. Next on their family hit list was their younger brother Eric, who had somehow slept through the whole ordeal. Like his father, he was beaten to death, only this time with a three-foot pickaxe handle. After the massacre was over, the trio stole a 12-gauge shotgun from the family home and set off in Brenda's 1988 Pontiac convertible. The next day at 5 p.m., Valerie approached the family home and reached for the front doorknob. She tried to turn it, but the door wouldn't open. Now, this was unusual as her sister-in-law, Brenda, always left it unlocked when she was at home, and she was home most of the time. Valerie had been given a key to get in, but before using it, she decided to step around to the side and try the garage door. The door was also locked. As she turned away, she noticed that Dennis's truck was still in the driveway, which was incredibly strange, as Dennis never missed a day of work. At that point, Valerie was worried. She rushed around the house and found that the sliding glass door was unlocked. Inside the house, it was so cold that she could see her breath in front of her. As she moved through the house, the silence filled her full of dread. As with Brian and David living there, the house was never quiet. She climbed the stairs and ran down the hallway to Eric's bedroom. Pushing the door open, she was met with a sight she would never forget. She left the house, almost falling down the stairs in her panic and called the police. Officer Pokran was soon on the scene, walking up to the snow-covered driveway. There, he saw two vehicles, a car and a van. As Valerie had discovered previously, the front door was locked. He went to the back, where he found the sliding glass doors open, exactly how Valerie had left it before leaving the house in a hurry. He returned back to the front and waited for backup as his gut instinct told him something terrible had happened inside of the house. When officer Michael Reddings arrived on the scene, he used Valerie's key to gain entrance through the front door. They then climbed the stairs with just the torch lights illuminating the space around them. To their horror, the beams of light caught blood soaked into the carpet. At the top of the landing, they looked down and flashed their beams again. Below, they could see the living room with the kitchen beyond that. In the kitchen, reflecting off the torch lights, was the aluminum baseball bat used in the murders. Still on the landing, they heard a dog barking, which they followed to a closed bedroom door. Not wanting to get bitten by the angry dog, police decided to explore the master bedroom first across the hall. In the room, they found Dennis Freeman sprawled out across his bed. His head and face had been smashed repeatedly with the baseball bat and metal bar. The strikes had been so hard, in fact, that his skull had been shattered and his brain had swelled out through it. To top things off, the boys had slit their father's throat. Down the hall, they entered Eric Freeman's bedroom. Just like his father, he lay in a lifeless heap on his bed with his face completely smashed beyond recognition. Fearing the worst, the police headed down to the basement where they discovered the bloody metal bar. It was in the back hallway that Brenda Freeman was discovered, with her nightgown pulled up, exposing her body. Right next to her sat a knife, the same knife that had been plunged into her torso again and again by her own son. The Freeman brothers and Birdwell drove all the way to Hope, Michigan in the stolen car. While there, they connected with a local skinhead associate called Frank Hesse. The brothers had met Hesse at a New Year's Eve party where they realized they all had the same twisted interest in the neo-Nazi agenda. For three days, the group hung out, listened to music, took drugs, and drank copious amounts of alcohol. Unfortunately for them, the police were quick to burst into the property to break up the party and arrest the killers. In an attempt to avoid the death penalty for mercilessly murdering his family, Brian pleaded guilty to his mother's murder and was convicted of the murder of his father, a fact that was pretty hard to avoid. Birdwell was tried for all three murders and convicted of Dennis's murder after DNA testing found the victim's blood on his t-shirt. Unbelievably, no one was ever convicted for Eric's murder, which is incredibly sad as he was the only Freeman kid who was actually a nice person. 
Years later, when asked why they snapped that day, Brian said it stemmed from years of animosity between their brothers and parents. Whatever excuse they try and tell themselves, the truth of the matter is that the brothers made their family's life a living hell, right up to the moment they brutally murdered them one by one. All three killers were miraculously spared the death penalty, but were sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Obviously, the three have been split up, with Brian being imprisoned at the Cole Township State Correctional Institute, David being held at the Mahanoy State Correctional Institution, and Birdwell being imprisoned at the Green State Correctional Institution. It's worth mentioning that Brian Freeman has been through a series of attorneys since his arrest in 1995, with his current attorney, Carl Schwartz, leading his defense, claiming that the man has a lot of remorse for what he did to his family. Unfortunately for the killer, the judge rejected the claim after a mental health prosecution studied him for some time and came to the conclusion that there is no way that Brian Freeman, along with David and Nelson, could ever be rehabilitated. It seems that once evil sets in and takes over a person's moral compass, it can never be wiped away. The killings of the Freeman family sparked one of the worst murder sprees in Lehigh County, as others took inspiration from the truly horrific crime. On February 27, 1995, just a day after the Freemans were killed, Jeffrey Howarth went into their house and picked his father's hunting rifle. He then waited for his parents to return home, shooting both parents the moment they walked into the house. This marked the second family to be butchered by a neo-Nazi skinhead in Lehigh County. After being arrested, Howarth said that he had been inspired by the Freeman brothers. Howarth was later acquitted by the jury on the grounds of insanity and forced to spend the rest of his life in a mental hospital. Interestingly, since the day of the Freeman murders and Howarth's apparent copycat killings, there have been 14 other similar Lehigh County murders done by skinheads who followed the neo-Nazi regime. Understandably, as the killings continued, parents in Lehigh County became more worried about their community. They accused the police of not helping wayward children who obviously needed mental help. Eventually, a kind of watchdog group was formed, watching out for and monitoring skidhead movements. They even had teachers and students watching out for any strange changes in their behavior. With unruly behavior and the telltale signs of violence being reported to police, things began to get better in the community. In fact, the group led to the arrest of Mark Thomas, who was arrested in a foiled bank robbery plot who turned out to be the leader of a white supremacist group called the Aryan Republican Army. Brothers of similar ages tend to bond over a shared interest in sports or the same music. But for these two skinhead brothers, they bonded over murdering their entire family, something that brings a whole new meaning to the term blood brothers. This story is shocking and goes to show that evil doesn't always come alone. It's hard to imagine that someone could brutally murder their own family members in the way that David and Brian Freeman did, despite whatever bad blood was shared between them. The saddest part of this story is the fact that the warning signs were there all along. With the neo-Nazi obsession, the trouble with the police, and Brenda's plea for help. To the man who fed his victim's flesh to his dinner guests. That's right. This is the case of Nikolai Jumakaliev. Born and raised in Yuzgaznach, Kazakhstan, in 1952, Nikolai was the fourth of five children. The strangest part, his childhood was what most would consider normal by all accounts. No crazy divorce, no childhood abuse or childhood traumas, just your standard upbringing. Given, I'm sure he had his lows from time to time, but he never experienced or behaved in ways of which most serial killers did in their younger days. As for his adolescence, he spent his days at railway school and even served in the military service in the Chemical Defense Corps at Samkard and Otar. After this, he attempted to become a driver and then went on to apply for universities. However, failed at achieving both of these goals. But don't let these shortcomings from his young adulthood affect the way you view young Nikolai, as he was a man valued for always being well-dressed and clean-shaven. 
and let's just say he had little to no trouble when it came to women. Nikolai was a hard-working man too. Having worked jobs such as being an electrician, a sailor, a forwarder, a bulldozer operator, I mean, the list just goes on. While on those jobs, he traveled across the country, only returning to his hometown in 1977, where he became a firefighter at 25 years old. It was at this point his life was slowly falling into place. Once he started seeing more money, he began hosting parties from time to time with all his friends. Now, I know what you're thinking. How does all of this life experience, career, and social success lead to anything remotely out of the norm, let alone the beginnings of a serial killer? Well, let's just say that Nikolai was enjoying himself a lot that year and contracted both syphilis and trichomonasis. He blamed women entirely for this, and thus his fierce resentment for women began. <laughs> Nikolai found his first victim in January of 1979. We don't know the exact date of the event because when Nikolai was captured, he couldn't remember the date himself. As you all know, after the whole STD incident, his anger toward women grew to new heights. By all means, he felt as though women were lower class citizens that had no place in the modern world. This led him to hunt down his very first victim and take her life in such a savage way that even Jeffrey Dahmer would want to vomit. Many years after being captured, Nikolai opened up to the police and told his story of his first victim. He said that he had been traveling down a rural path somewhere in Yuzgaznach. As he was moving along the path, he noticed a young woman in the distance. He remembers being very attracted to the woman, but rather than continuing strolling like any normal person, he decided to do the unthinkable. Nikolai charged toward her from behind. He wasn't even trying to be discreet. By all means, he didn't care if she saw him coming because he knew he was gonna get the job done. As he ran up behind her, she spun around after hearing his pouncing footsteps. Nikolai recalls that as he drew closer to her, his heart began to pound with excitement. The woman did her best to run away, but Nikolai had gained too much ground on her for her to even stand a chance. Within a few short moments, he had her in his grasp, and he began to wrap his arm around her neck so she could neither breathe nor scream. Nikolai didn't waste any time. While this was a rural area, there was still a good chance that someone may pass by and see him. So, without hesitation, he used his tools on her throat and let her bleed out. Though, this is where things get twisted. Nikolai didn't want to waste her innocent blood, so he began to drink it. Yeah, you heard me right. Just like a vampire from a horror movie, Nikolai began to drink the young woman's blood. As he was doing so, he heard a bus approaching from a distance. To avoid getting caught, he dragged the woman's body down low onto the ground and crunched down until the bus passed by. To his luck, he was left unnoticed, and his activities from that night were left a mystery to the rest of the city. Oh, and I'm not even halfway through what he did that night. After Nikolai saw that the coast was clear, he began to carry out some of the most horrific acts you could imagine with the young woman's body. I'll leave most of it up to your imagination as it's uh, not exactly YouTube friendly. Let's just say that he treated her body as if it was a large steak. He of course needed to see if it was cooked to his liking. And he began tearing up the insides of the uh, steak. He did so with complete disregard for the woman's dignity and literally separate her apart limb from limb, as though she were nothing more than a piece of butcher meat. And what's a piece of butcher meat without a little barbecue? He began to load large portions of her body into his backpack. He then carried them home and began to detach the fat from the muscle and meat. He turned her fat into oil after cooking it for quite some time and even went as far as pickling certain parts of her body. To spice things up a bit and add some variety to his diet, he put other portions of the woman's body through a grinder and made meatballs out of them. He kept all of the meat for himself and never shared it with anyone, and thankfully so. He says that he was able to eat for an entire month using nothing but the body of this innocent young woman. In his own words, Nikolai said, 
It was tough, and I had to cook it for a long time in its own fat. The first time I ate human flesh, I had to force myself, but then I got used to it. It would be just a short time later that the remnants of the woman's body were found in the woods on January 25th, 1979. Police opened an investigation into the matter, but since Nikolai had no connections with the woman, the case ran cold for many years. And a whole lot went down in between those years. It wouldn't take long for Nikolai to continue his spree and claim the lives of several more women. Many reports say that Nikolai would claim the majority of his victims during the twilight hours at a local park. As with most cases of serial killers, we don't know for sure how many lives he claimed. However, it is known that Nikolai took the lives of more than five women between January and August of 1979. Though some sources even go as far as claiming Nikolai could have killed as many as 100 people. As for the other five confirmed victims, he managed to get away with each and every one of these cases. He even cannibalized every one of these victims, cutting them apart in a very similar manner to his first victim. However, Nikolai would soon make a mistake that almost marked the end of his spree. On August 21st, Nikolai was working at the fire station when he accidentally shot one of his co-workers while he was severely intoxicated. We don't know how this took place exactly, but it seems like the two were probably goofing around and being reckless when the gun went off. Whatever took place that day, Nikolai was arrested and taken to the police station. Police could immediately tell that something wasn't right with this guy, so he was transferred to a nearby mental health facility known as Serb Sky Center. He was evaluated by several doctors at the clinic and he would soon be diagnosed with schizophrenia, a common mental disorder among serial killers. Nikolai would lay low and remain in this facility for about a year. You may rightfully have assumed that while he was being held here, he worked on himself and got treatment for both his mental illness and his sadistic tendencies. However, you'd be very, very wrong. Nikolai was finally released and almost immediately after being sent back into the free world, he went back to his old ways. In the later months of 1980, he took the lives of three more women. It's so disturbing to know that Nikolai was within the police grasps this entire time. They had been actively investigating the murders, yet they had no idea he was responsible. This marked the first time that Nikolai was able to slip out of the hands of the police. And yes, you heard me right. This is the first time. There were others. After his stay at the mental health facility, Nikolai was eventually able to return to society and live a fairly normal life. Even though he had been diagnosed with multiple STDs after living such a frivolous lifestyle, Nikolai continued to host parties at his home, just like old times, and would invite over all sorts of people. Some friends, some acquaintances, and sometimes people he barely knew. In this instance, he was hosting a party and invited over several of his close friends and their girlfriends. When he would host these parties, Nikolai would be sure that everyone had something to drink and there was plenty of food available. It seems like he was genuinely loving hosting parties and would prepare large amounts of food and let his guests eat whatever they wanted. However, he would later confess he would feed his victims to his party goers without them knowing. It is unknown how many of his friends became unwitting cannibals. While hosting what is known to be his last ever party, everything was going relatively well. At some point, Nikolai convinced one of the party goers to come with him to a separate room. This would mark the capture of his ninth victim. But unlike his other victims, this one was a male. After the two had vanished into the other room for quite some time, Nikolai's friends came to check on them. When they opened the door, they found that Nikolai had taken the man's life and had begun to dismember the body, just like he had done so many times before. His guests found the decapitated head of one of their friends, as well as his intestines. The partygoers obviously fled from the home, completely shocked and dumbfounded by what they had just seen. At this point, things get a bit strange because for some unknown reason, Nikolai didn't even bother hiding or even leaving his home. Instead, he continued working on his latest victim until the police showed up. 
When the cops finally walked in on him, they found him crouched down on his knees, covered in blood. The police were so taken aback by what they had just walked in on that while they were doing their best to process the situation, Nikolai was able to run off and flee into the nearby mountains. According to the responding officers, he was completely nude when he made a run for it. All he took with him was the machete he had used on the victim. He managed to hide out in the woods of the mountains for several hours and was not found until the following day. He was arrested on December 19, 1980 and once again taken into police custody. By this point, Nikolai's face had been plastered across newspapers, television, and magazines. His killing spree had slowly started to gain worldwide recognition, as viewers were left in awe by his gruesome acts against these innocent people. The media had begun to refer to him as Metal Fang, as he had metal teeth implanted into his mouth as a result of a street fight from his younger days. However, this might have even helped for devouring his victims. He was held in police custody for nearly a full year before he was sent to trial. When he finally made his way into the courtroom, the case was super simple and, for the most part, short-lived. Everyone knew about the atrocious crimes he had committed, so the judge knew exactly what sentence he wanted to hand down to Nikolai. Not guilty. That's right, Nikolai's conviction was that he was not guilty. After looking through his previous diagnosis with a deliberating mental illness, the courts underwent further mental assessment to Nikolai and eventually declared him legally insane, thus sending him away to a mental health facility. Thankfully, this time he wasn't allowed to check out after just a few months. A court order was in place that forbade him from leaving the facility under any circumstances. So, much like a normal prison sentence, Nikolai was kept under close surveillance for nearly a decade. While spending time here, rumors began to spread that he had escaped the facility and had gone on the run. These rumors were fueled by the fact that despite his arrest, bodies continued to turn up at an alarming rate. Magazines and newspapers began to spread wild theories about Nikolai, but they would soon learn that Nikolai wasn't the only killer who had been terrorizing the area. There was now a copycat by the name of Alexander Skrynik. Alexander had claimed the lives of several women and dismembered their bodies just like Nikolai. He went for the same type of victims, used the same type of tools, and conducted the same butchering process to the victims' lifeless bodies. However, Nikolai's escape rumors were eventually put to rest after Alexander was turned into police after one of his friends reported him. Alexander was quickly sentenced to be executed, unlike Nikolai. After spending several years in the mental institution, Nikolai filed a request to be transferred to a new facility. We don't know much about the specifics of his request, but courts accepted his proposal and agreed to have him transferred to a normal mental hospital rather than a maximum security hospital. While spending time at his current facility, Nikolai was deemed cured several times and most of his doctors felt as though he didn't pose any real risk to the outside world. For this reason, the court system didn't see any reason to not allow him to move on to a normal health facility. Though everything was not as it seemed. While being transferred, Nikolai managed to escape and hijack the car he was being transported in. He then took off and wandered around the Soviet Union for several months. There were rumors that he committed another string of murders in Moscow and Kazakhstan, but these rumors were not confirmed. However, he did send a letter to one of his friends, and the stamp proved that the letter was sent from Moscow, around the same time that the new string of murders took place. Whether Nikolai was truly responsible for these murders is not known, but it seems like too much of a coincidence to not be true. But that's just me guessing. No one really knows. There were reports claiming that Nikolai bribed a friend to mail the letter from Moscow to send police in the wrong direction, giving him more time to escape. This is certainly possible, but there is no way to know for sure what happened here. Regardless, I have to say his escape is impressive. I mean, come on, the dude's life sounds like a movie. Dinner parties with his victims as food, 
receiving a not guilty verdict after nine murders, and then manipulating the doctors and escaping a maximum security mental asylum? How is this not a movie yet? At the end of it all, Nikolai would be captured once again after staging the theft of a sheep in Fergana. Police don't know how he ended up in the Soviet Union, but it seems like Nikolai wanted to be sent to prison in this area for a much more minor crime, though he never revealed why he wanted to go to prison. In the end, police realized who he was, and he was transported back to Kazakhstan to a psychiatric hospital. Even after all of this, Nikolai's doctors still believe that he is a healed man. They say he exhibits no signs of bad behavior, and they feel as though he could be reintegrated into society at some point. He is currently held in a prison and works by repairing small equipment. While living in this new mental facility, Nikolai mailed in a request to have his sentence altered to give him the death penalty. But the courts denied this, since his doctors felt like he was on a solid path to recovery. By 2014, police were finishing up the details of a murder investigation that took place in Aktob. To the surprise of some of the doctors in Nikolai's clinic, he was found to have been responsible for the murder, which took place in 1990 while he was on the run. Nikolai was convicted of his 10th and presumably final murder, and the 68-year-old will likely remain in the Kazakhstan mental facility for the rest of his life. This next case is just sickening. Bobby Joe Long's serial killing spree in Florida ultimately led to his execution. Beloved family man Bobby Joe Long had been hiding a dark secret from his family for three long years. That being that he would take advantage of innocent and unsuspecting women in his community. As is often the case with the monsters we cover on this channel, the sickness in his mind spread turning the serial pervert into a serial killer. For eight months in 1984, the loving father would turn his back on his family during his spare time and would go on to kidnap and murder nine young women. A man who may never have been caught, if not for an ironic glimmer of mercy. Robert Joseph Long was born in Canova, West Virginia, on October 14, 1953, but moved with his mother to Miami as a child. Long's disturbing feelings toward women began with his mother, with whom he shared a bed until he was 13. As we have seen multiple times on the cases we cover here on Twisted Minds, serial killers often have rough childhood experiences that affect them in later life. In the case of Bobby Joe Long, he fell off a swing and suffered his first of several head injuries at just the age of five. One can only imagine what this does to a growing young child. Following his high school years, he would endure horrific bullying instances after developing breasts during puberty due to a genetic disorder called Kleinfelter syndrome. These dark days soon turned him to dark desires, of which he wouldn't hold back on. At the age of just 13, he decided to kill his dog by shooting it in its genitals. An act that was a telltale sign of his mental instabilities. When asked why he killed his pet, he said it was because the dog was eating better than he was. After high school, he joined the military. During his time enlisted in the army, Long suffered another head injury when he crashed a motorbike. While in the hospital, he began to have unpredictable and violent outbursts and developed an unhealthy obsession with sex. In fact, even while in a body cast, Long managed to pleasure himself at least five times a day. Things seemed to get better for Long in 1974 after he married his high school girlfriend, Cynthia Barthlett. Together, they had two children. His violent outbursts didn't stop there, however, with one report from Cynthia claiming that he once choked her unconscious and slammed her head against a television. When she woke up, Long was crying for forgiveness, but added that if she told the hospital what had happened, he would kill her when she got home.
Bobby Joe Long's obsession with sex only got worse as the years went on. He satisfied this desire by looking through classified ads, going to the seller's home, and then taking sexual advantage over the women if they were alone. To do this, he would pull a knife on them, tie them up, assault them, and then rob their homes afterward. Between 1981 and 1984, Long committed dozens of sexual attacks using this same method, with some estimating that he assaulted at least 50 women during that time. Shockingly, he was charged in 1981 for an attack, but a conviction meant that the case was acquitted. Long would then move from Miami to Tampa in 1984, and he'd often cruise the clubs and bars for prostitutes to further satisfy his sexual appetite. Eventually, having sex wasn't enough, turning the sexual predator into a killer. The first of Bobby Joe Long's victims was 20-year-old Artis Wick, who he abducted took sexual advantage of, and strangled on March 27, 1984. Her body was found on November 22, 1984. A month and a half later, on May 13, the body of 19-year-old Noan Thai Lana Long, an exotic dancer at Nebraska Avenue's Sly Fox Lounge, was discovered in a field. She was naked and tied with a cord wrapped tightly around her neck. Two weeks after that, the body of former beauty contestant Michelle Sims was found near an interstate overpass. Sims was also naked and tied up, with her throat slit. Michelle had been working as a receptionist at the time, but was reportedly also an avid drug user who was involved in sex work to pay for her habit. On June 24, 1984, Elizabeth Lallenbach's body was discovered fully clothed despite being taken sexual advantage of and strangled. Elizabeth was a factory worker who had never been involved in prostitution. She just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, simply walking down the street just blocks from her house when she was abducted by this vile monster. The fifth victim of Bobby Joe Long was 21-year-old Vicki Elliott who disappeared on September 7, 1984, on her way home from waitressing at the Ramada Inn. Exactly a month later, on October 7, 1984, 18-year-old Chanel William was the next victim to lose her life at the hands of Long. Chanel was also a sex worker, but her profile differed from all of the other victims. First of all, she was the only black victim. And secondly, she had not been tied up or strangled. Instead, she was shot dead and left naked on the ground. One week later, Karen Dinfren's body was found, with the post-mortem determining that she had died from strangulation and bludgeoning. One of the final murder victims of Bobby Joe Long was Kimberly Hobbs, whose murder was not initially linked to Long. Like many of the other victims, she was naked and difficult to identify because she was left out in the elements for months. Bobby Joe Long seemed to be slipping through the nets of law enforcement for the better part of the year, but one brave teenager was to change all of that and give all the silent victims the justice they deserved. Investigators frantically interviewed people in the community and watched suspicious areas among the Tampa Strip in the hopes of catching their killer. They used the evidence that they had gathered to try and narrow down their search, to no avail. That is, until the abduction of 17-year-old Lisa McVeigh. While on her way home from work during the night of November 3, 1984, Lisa was grabbed off her bicycle and tied up by Long, hiding in the bushes along the road. He told her he had a gun and a knife before blindfolding her and forcing the young girl into his car. Terrified she was going to die, she begged him not to hurt her and said that she would do whatever he wanted. In response, he ordered her to remove her clothes in his car and to perform oral sex on him, acts that she reluctantly did. He then drove her around for a while before eventually bringing her back to his apartment, where he kept her hostage. The sickening ordeal lasted 26 hours as Long repeatedly forced her to perform sexual acts on him and even made her shower with him. 
Despite her terror, Lisa managed to keep her head clear. She looked for clues that would help identify the man if she ever got free. At one point, her kidnapper stopped at an automated teller machine to grab some cash. So, she peered under the blindfold at the dashboard and memorized what she could see of the car's interior. She continued to get quick glimpses as they arrived at Long's home, remembering that the building was white and that the steps up to it were red. Although Bobby Joe Long insisted that she kept her eyes shut as he abused her, she managed to get a look at the interior of the accommodation. She also dropped a barrette next to the bed to prove that she had been there. To think of how terrified that girl must have been, to come up with all of these clever ways to help catch Long, just goes to show how determined she was to get justice, whether she lived through the ordeal or not. After taking advantage of the girl multiple times, Long fell asleep. When he woke up, he stopped calling her bitch and instead affectionately called her babe. Lisa could see that he was softening toward her, even saying that he wished he could keep her around. Soon after, he bundled the girl into his car and drove for a while. Lisa thought that she was about to die, but to her surprise, was simply told to get out and take care before speeding off. Lisa wasted no time in getting home, waking her father and telling him everything that had happened, which led to the police being called. The investigators working the serial killer case didn't yet realize it, but this was the big break they needed. Lisa described her kidnapper as a white male in his mid-30s. He had a deep voice, brown hair, and a layered haircut. He had thin eyebrows, a short mustache, big nose, small ears, and good teeth. He was compact but slightly overweight and had come across as somewhat feminine in his mannerisms. She went on to describe that the car that she had been abducted in, which was a dark red two-door Dodge Magnum with a red steering wheel and dashboard and white seats and interior. She also shared details about the apartment where she'd been taken advantage of and tried to give the officers a rough idea of its location as well as the location of the bank where they had stopped. But the blindfold had made it too difficult to see. During the investigation, red fibers found on Lisa and his other murder victims were all identified and matched, meaning that they now had a detailed description of the serial killer from the only known living victim. Sadly, all this information didn't lead to an instant arrest, which let Long go back to his murderous ways. Long's final victim willingly entered his car, but tried to fight him off after he got violent. The killer eventually strangled her to death before driving around with the corpse in the passenger side. He even pulled over for some gas before taking the body out into the country to dump it. While police continued their efforts to find the man responsible for the horrific crimes, the remains of two more victims were discovered. 18-year-old Virginia Johnson on November 6th, and 21-year-old Kim Swan on November 12th. Only bones were left of Virginia, but a ligature cord was found at the scene. Kim, who had been a dancer at the Sly Fox, had ligature marks on her neck and wrists. Once again, red carpet fibers were found at both crime scenes, making it easy for police to connect all of the crimes to one man. Following information from Lisa McVeigh about her abductor's car having Magnum printed on the dashboard, police acquired a list of all 1978 Dodge Magnum owners in Hillsborough County and then looked into the records for all bank machines in North Tampa. Analyzing the list, they found that only one 1978 Dodge Magnum owner had used a bank machine at 3 a.m. on the night of Lisa McVeigh's abduction. Bobby Joe Long. Authorities quickly found Long's car and his home not too far from the bank machine he had used. They then watched Long for 24 hours before arresting him for Lisa's kidnapping and sexual crimes on November 16th. During his interrogation, Bobby Joe Long confessed to the kidnapping and sexual crimes of Lisa McVeigh. Initially, he denied killing all of the other women, but once he heard about the evidence police had against him, particularly 
the red carpet fibers that had come from his car, he soon confessed to everything. The Hillsborough County State's Attorney's Office confronted Long with the irrefutable evidence against him. The State Attorney and the Public Defender's Office eventually reached a plea bargain for eight of the murders and the abductions and sexual crimes of Lisa McVeigh. Long pleaded guilty on September 24, 1985, receiving 26 life sentences without the possibility of parole and seven life sentences with the possibility of parole after 25 years. In short, this monster would never be free to prey on any more young women ever again. For the state, locking the monster away forever wasn't enough. In July 1986, the penalty phase of Michelle Sims' murder trial was held in Tampa, which lasted a week and drew a lot of media attention. Long was eventually found guilty and was sentenced to die in Florida's electric chair. On February 24, 1999, Long accused the Capitol Collateral Regional Council of revealing his private letters to a book author, which would have violated attorney-client privilege. He also accused the agency of running a death pool, betting on the date that he would be executed. I guess it's true what they say. You can bet on just about anything. It blows my mind that someone who took advantage and killed so many women could have his feelings hurt by a couple of guards making a few extra bucks. Regardless, an investigation concluded that the allegations were false and the case was soon dropped. On May 23rd, 2019, Bobby Joe Long was executed by lethal injection. Up to that point, he was one of the longest serving inmates on death row. Lisa McVeigh made sure that she got a front row view at the moment the killer lost his life. In a book she wrote about the encounter, she described how she wanted to look him in the eyes, but unfortunately, he didn't open his eyes even once. In an interview with Long's wife, Cindy Brown, she recalled a time that she had loaded a shotgun and planned on shooting him to stop all the abuse inflicted on her. She eventually decided against it as to not hurt their children emotionally, a decision that she regrets to this day, after finding out about all of his other innocent young victims. Richard Cottingham's reign over New York dubbed him by many the Times Square Killer. New York is known for many things, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But what happens when a combination of insatiable lust, psychopathic tendencies, and an obsession with detective shows is dropped into a city of endless possibilities? This is the story of Richard Cottingham. With about 100 suspected murderers and only a few victims identified to date, there aren't many who come close to the prowess of this man. His very existence is proof of just how blind we can be to the things going on around us if they aren't loud enough to catch our attention. It's also a testament to how the system, put in place to safeguard the life and interest of the public, struggled to keep up with even the most average criminal at the time. We'll be diving into the case of Richard Cottingham the big bad wolf of Times Square, who terrorized the sleepless city of Manhattan and New Jersey, leaving multiple dismembered bodies in his wake. Dubbed the Torso Killer, the Times Square Torso Ripper, or simply the Times Square Killer, Cottingham had quite the reputation in the late 1900s. Without further ado, let's delve into the dark, twisted history of one of the most successful serial predators to make his mark in New York. Richard Cottingham was born in 1946 in the Bronx, New York, before moving with his family to New Jersey after he turned 12. He was the oldest of three kids, born to a homemaker mother and a father who worked for an insurance company. Richard was in the seventh grade when his family relocated to New Jersey, and he was slow to make friends both in the new school and neighborhood. He also couldn't find any solace in sports because his eyesight was terrible. It wasn't until high school that he was allowed into the track team, but 
Even then, he barely fit in and he spent the bulk of his time alone. Upon graduation, Richard got a job in the same company as his father. While taking computer classes, he served as the company's computer operator. When Richard turned 20, he got the chance to move on from his father's work. Blue Cross Blue Shield employed him as a computer operator. This would appear to be the turning point in his life because after an entire lifetime of little to no signs of homicidal thoughts, he murdered a fellow resident of his town just a year after landing the new job. Richard was your typical nice guy in the beginning. He was raised in a Catholic family and seemed to be having a great time until they moved to Rivervale in New Jersey. Richard seemed hardest hit by the change in environment and he became a loner soon afterward. His friendships were few and far between and he preferred to stay at home and keep to himself. It was at this point that he made the biggest and most defining discovery of his teenage years pornography. Richard surfed long enough to arrive at the bondage section. It seemed to have unlocked a dark part of his psychology because he became obsessed with bondage pornography. Now we can't knock anyone for preference and kinks of course, but with the correlation with his obsession and his soon to be non-consensual sex crimes are horrifying. To everyone around him, Richard looked like he was doing well for himself. Things couldn't be better and he was making significant strides after school. With good grades, a solid gig upon graduation, early marriage, and a few children, there was nothing left to desire or be desired in life. Or was there now? Underneath Richard's warm, overachieving exterior was a cold, sad, predatory lunatic lurking in the shadows. This beast within Richard surfaced momentarily in 1968 when he murdered his first victim, Nancy Vogel. The mother of two lived in the same neighborhood as Richard, Little Fairy, and was on her way to bingo when she made a last minute stop at the mall. There, she met her end at the hands of her unneighborly neighbor, who strangled, stripped, and abandoned her lifeless body in the car. Nancy's case was a head scratcher for the police who couldn't produce any suspects or leads. The case started to collect dust over time until it was turned cold and was forgotten. Richard turned to petty crimes the next year when he was caught for drunk driving through the city. Three years down the line, he tried to shoplift from a store but was caught. It made no sense why Richard tried to steal or what he intended to take. There was no history of him purchasing anything in particular, and it was uncertain if he was short on money, which would have been strange considering his steady employment. All he got was small jail time and a fine. Perhaps deciding that petty crimes were not his thing, Richard moved back to the big leagues. In 1973, a woman called the cops on him, and he was taken away. He was charged with robbery, sodomy, and sexual assault. but. The judicial system was again swift to dismiss the case. Time went by and Richard became as deranged as they come. He made the trip to New York every day for his work but didn't return home all the time. Sometimes the crazy took over. He stayed in the city to let loose. He stalked multiple bars in Manhattan, biding his time and watching for poor, unsuspecting women trying to relax after a tough day. Richard had specific tastes, and once he found women that fit the bill, he swung into action. He played the old trick of drugging their drinks before moving them to a motel to enact his sexual fantasies, which took the form of torturing his victims for hours. In 1974, a year after his previous court case, Richard was taken to court again twice. First, he was charged with robbery and unlawful imprisonment, while the second case cited sodomy and robbery. By now, you'd think his other cases would serve as precedents to open the eyes of the court to a disturbing pattern. But you'd be wrong. Richard's sight was perfect in comparison to the criminal justice system because both cases were dismissed. While Richard seemed to avoid murdering women in 1978, he didn't exactly stay crime free. He went on a torture streak on two women one of whom was pregnant. He may have caused more havoc than that,
but only this much is known for now. By 1979, Richard decided he'd given the city enough time to recover from his murders. So he kidnapped Helen Sykes, a teenage sex worker from Times Square. She turned up dead after several days, with her throat slit deeply enough to almost sever her head. Her legs had also been mutilated. It was around this time his wife filed for divorce, claiming that Richard was mentally cruel, unsupportive, and had abandoned his family. And what do you know? It was never completed. Cottingham preferred his targets petite and blonde, toward their mid-twenties and mostly sex workers. He had a way of soliciting them that was surprisingly successful just before he distracted them enough to spike their drinks. His go-to drug was Tuanol, which was commonly used for spiking drinks before roofies entered the scene. He usually found his victims at bars before moving them to secluded locations, preferably a motel. There, Richard bound his victims and gagged them with duct tape. Having secured them in place, he had his way with strangling victims before proceeding to torture them. His go-to torture techniques were scratching or biting hard on their nipples and making them refer to him as master. Other times, he cut around the breasts and threatened them with a toy gun. To spice up the ordeal, he sometimes left the gun within reach of the victim to give them a false sense of hope. And when they grabbed it and pulled the trigger, they'd find it was fake. The deranged show ended with stabbings and stranglings with a ligature. With his DNA all over the scene, you'd think this guy would be an easy catch, but Richard knew a thing or two about forensics and did his best to frustrate the authorities. First, he made it difficult to identify his victims because he made souvenirs of their mutilated hands and heads. He also took their personal effects like jewelry and the likes as some sort of sick trophy to remember them by. Richard took his time to clear the crime scene and dispose of bodies in secluded locations. Other times, he just set the room on fire and made a run for it. Between 1967 and 1989, there are nine known cases of murder against Richard, with another four on the grounds of attempted murder. On his own, he claimed to have killed up to 100 people. His first named victim was Marilyn Carr, a 26-year-old nurse Richard abducted from her apartment parking lot and took her to a motel where she was subsequently tortured and murdered. In the year that followed, he adopted a new alias for approaching women. He introduced himself to a certain Karen Schilt as John Schaefer before drugging her drink at the bar and taking her to an undisclosed location. There, he took sexual advantage of her and dumped her in the sewers next to an apartment complex. Luckily enough for Karen, she was discovered by hotel staff. Upon recovering, she couldn't remember the details of the assault, and the case was all but dead until Richard was apprehended. In October of the same year, he met Susan Geiger, whom he also drugged and played out his sexual fantasies. He tried to murder her, but she got away. His biggest known night of crime was in December of 1979, when he accosted two sex workers and drove them to the Travel Lodge Motor Inn in New York. Throughout the night, he tortured and killed the duo before mutilating their bodies. He severed their hands and heads for his trophy cabinet and started a fire to burn the bodies and the room. Richard made his escape before staff discovered smoke seeping through the door. After putting out the fire, only one of the victims could be identified, Dida Godzari. The other victim remains unknown, but she was estimated to be a teenager. By the turn of the new year, Richard doubled down on his attacks. He assaulted four women within three weeks. His first victim was Valerie Ann Street, whom he murdered and burned in a hotel room. Next was Pamela Winesfield, who was fortunate enough to survive. The third victim was Ann Rayner, whose charred body was found in Manhattan South in a hotel room. But rather than taking her hands and head as usual, he took her breasts. Richard Cottingham's luck ran out in 1989 when he solicited Leslie Ann O'Dell, 
an 18-year-old sex worker who sold her trade on Lexington Avenue and 25th Street. She agreed to $100 for some action, and the duo checked into a room at Hasbrook Heights Quality Inn. Interestingly enough, Richard was a repeat customer at the inn, and he had picked a room in which he had previously mutilated and murdered a victim. What could go wrong? Leslie noted that he was nice and courteous, and the night was off to a great start. Ever the gentleman, he offered her a massage, and she agreed. Having rolled over onto her stomach, Richard straddled her back and produced a knife. He pressed the cold, hard steel against her throat, rendering her helpless. The subdued Leslie was promptly handcuffed as the torture session began. He beat, bit, and played out his sexual fantasies on her, all the while insisting, you have to take it. The other girls did. You have to take it too. You're a whore and you have to be punished. Although she'd been gagged, Odell's cry grew loud enough to attract external attention. Richard had been biting down on one of her nipples. He almost tore it free. The motel staff, who had already seen a murder scene some days back, didn't hesitate to bring in the police. They marched in on the room and demanded Richard open the door. The arriving officers arrested Cottingham in the hallway of the motel with personal effects like two slave collars, handcuffs, replica pistols, a leather gag, several prescription pills, and a switchblade. While he was being interrogated, Richard claimed that his actions were consensual and he paid Leslie $180 for sex. He was kept for further investigations when the pattern of his murder started to come to light. First, Valerie Ann Street's crime scene turned up a fingerprint from a pair of handcuffs that matched Richard's. Next, the police raided his home and found tons of evidence incriminating him for multiple murders, like the key to Mary Ann Carr's house, Ann Rayner, and Dita Gonzalez's jewelry, and a pair of earrings and a koala bear belonging to Valerie Ann Street. His handwriting also matched several motel rooms he'd rented for earlier murders. His room and car trunk also turned up more personal effects of his many victims, some of which have yet to be identified. Cottingham was indicted in New Jersey for a host of charges, such as aggravated assault while armed, fellatio, sodomy, attempted murder, and possession of a controlled substance. The next year, Richard Cottingham was found guilty of 15 of the 20 charges against him. Over the next three years, he was tried for several other cases of attempted murder and murders. During this time, he's attempted to take his life twice in court to no avail. In the early 1980s, he was convicted for five murders. He pled guilty to Nancy Vogel's murder in 2010, for which he received a 100-year sentence. And as recently as 2021, he was found guilty of abducting, taking advantage of, and drowning teenage girls Mary Ann Pryor and Laureen Mary Kelly in 1974. For prosecution immunity, Richard also confessed to murdering three women. Denise Falaska from Colster, Irene Blaze from Bogota, and Jacqueline Harp from Midland Park between 1968 and 1969. Cottingham has been tried several times and found guilty all through. There is a staggering amount of evidence against him, ranging from receipts he wrote and signed, which link him to the only recovered fingerprint in hotel history. There are also the testimonies of three survivors. Richard faces multiple trials for his crimes in both New York City and New Jersey. Richard may have vanquished New York, but have you ever wondered who was the first ever to do it in America? Well, this is the case of America's first ever serial killer. Herman Webster Mudgett is a man that lives on in history as one of America's first serial killers. In his day, he built the hotel famously called Murder Castle. And it is safe to say that the things that happened there would leave you in shock. The hotel was home to none other than the bodies of Herman's victims which authorities eventually found. But just how many bodies did the police discover? 50? Perhaps 100? And what exactly did Herman do to his victims? Well, you are about to find out. Before we get into this video, it's important to note that there are several inconsistencies in the different accounts of the life of H. Holmes. 
These inconsistencies stem from the fact that there was no proper documentation of Holmes's crimes, aside from the information contained in the tabloids. At the time, the tabloids were in the habit of exaggerating facts in order to thrill the public. With that being said, let's get into it, shall we? Herman Webster Mudgett, who lived most of his life going by the alias Howard Holmes, was born on May 16, 1861, in Gilmanton, New Hampshire. His parents were Levi Horton Mudgett and Theodate Page Price, and were said to be descendants of the first English immigrants in Gilmanton. In his family, Holmes was the third and middle child, having two older siblings and two younger ones. Holmes' father worked several jobs in order to cater for his family. And these jobs included farming, trading, and house painting. It was also said that both Levi and his wife were devout Methodists. So we can assume that they raised their children in the same manner. Holmes was 16 when he graduated from Phillips Exeter Academy. And he wasted no time in taking up a job as a teacher in Gilmanton and later on in nearby Alton. On July 4th, 1878, the young teacher married his first wife, Clara Lovering. The two got married in Alton, and two years later, on February 3rd, 1880, they welcomed their son, Robert Lovering Mudgett. Robert was born in Loudoun, New Hampshire. When Holmes was 18, the young father enrolled at the University of Vermont in Burlington. However, he left a year later, seemingly unsatisfied with the school. In 1882, a very determined Holmes took another step toward furthering his education and enrolled in the University of Michigan's Department of Medicine and Surgery. While in this university, Holmes worked in the anatomy lab under the chief anatomy instructor at the time, Professor William James Herdman. It was said that both men engaged in grave robbing to supply dead bodies for practical purposes. After each grave robbing exercise, Holmes would burn or disfigure the corpses to make it look like they had been killed in an accident. As if that was not enough, he took out insurance policies on them before planting the bodies and usually collecting money after the bodies had been discovered. In the aspect of his domestic life, housemates and neighbors testified that Holmes was often violent with his wife Clara, so much so that in 1884, she moved back to New Hampshire and later wrote that she didn't know much about him. In June of the same year, Holmes graduated from the University of Michigan's Department of Medicine and Surgery after doing well in his exams. After his graduation, Holmes moved to Moore's Forks in New York. And when people began to say that they had seen him with a boy who later disappeared, it became clear that wherever this violent man went, trouble followed. In response to the allegations leveled against him, Holmes began to tell people that the boy's home was in Massachusetts and that he had gone back there. The matter was not investigated and Holmes immediately left the area. Not too long after, Holmes decided he was done with New York altogether and traveled to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. There, he got a job as a keeper at Norristown State Hospital. But in line with his reputation, Holmes didn't keep the job very long. Soon after, he found another job, but this time it was at a drugstore in Philadelphia. This did not last long either because during his service there, a boy died after taking drugs that were purchased from the store. Holmes, of course, said that he had no involvement in the child's death and quickly left the city. At this time, he still went by Herman Webster Mudgett, but soon after, he changed his name to Henry Howard Holmes, short for H.H. H. Holmes. In 1886, Holmes married Murder Belknap. The two got married in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and weeks following their marriage, Holmes filed for divorce from his first wife, Clara. His claim for divorcing her was infidelity, but since the claim could not be proven, the lawsuit yielded zero results. Also, some paperwork showed that Clara had not been informed of the suit, so the divorce could not be finalized. Holmes traveled to Chicago in August 1886, and at this time he started going by the name H.H. H. Holmes. In Chicago, the 25-year-old stumbled upon Elizabeth Holton's drugstore, at the northwest corner of South Wallace Avenue in West 63rd Street in Englewood. Holton gave Holmes a job in the drugstore, a position that he seemed to enjoy because in very little time he had warmed his way into the Holton's hearts by being an extremely hard-working employee. 
In fact, the couple adored him to the point that they sold the drugstore to him. While some accounts say that Holmes purchased the store after Mr. Holton died and left it to his widow, who disappeared shortly afterward and wasn't seen again, the truth is that the couple remained in Englewood throughout Holmes' life and even went on to outlive him. After purchasing the drugstore, Holmes went on to buy an empty space across from the drugstore, and in 1887, construction began for a two-story mixed-use building with apartments on the second floor and rental spaces, plus an additional drugstore. In the aspect of his personal life, Holmes and Murda had a daughter on June 4, 1889. She was called Lucy Theodate Holmes and was born in Englewood, Chicago, Illinois. The three lived together in Wilmette, Illinois, with Holmes spending most of his time in Chicago, attending to business. On April 17, 1891, a man named John Dubroy, who was also described as one of Holmes' creditors, died of apoplexy in the drugstore. And, as expected, people began to grow suspicious. In early June, the lawsuit Holmes filed against Clara was dismissed on the grounds of want of persecution. Shortly after the storm about John's death blew over, Holmes added a third floor to his already constructed two-story building. He told the investors that he planned to use it as a hotel for the upcoming World's Columbian Exposition. The hotel was eventually somewhat completed, with three stories in a basement. The ground floor served as the storefront. In recent years, several reports claim that Holmes's reason for constructing such a hotel was to lure tourists visiting the World Fair so that he could kill them and sell their skeletons to medical schools. Reports from the Yellow Press describe the hotel as Holmes's murder castle, saying that the building had secret torture chambers, trapdoors, gas chambers, and a basement crematorium. Other reports claim that the hotel contained more than a hundred rooms and had an outline of a maze with doors opening into brick walls, rooms without windows, and staircases leading to dead ends. Another school of thought said that the building indeed contained some hidden rooms, but those rooms were used to hide furniture Holmes bought on credit and didn't want to pay for. Shortly after its completion, people began coming into the hotel to seek residence. One of them was Ned Connor. He had moved into Holmes's hotel and had also happened to be working at Holmes's pharmacy jewelry counter. He had a wife named Julia Smythe, with whom Holmes was having an affair. When Ned found out, he quit his job and left, leaving Julia with their daughter Pearl. Julia gained custody of Pearl but didn't leave the hotel. Instead, she continued her relationship with Holmes. On Christmas Eve of 1891, Julia and her daughter disappeared. Holmes claimed that she had died during an abortion. As for Pearl, he admitted to poisoning her to keep her from revealing the circumstances surrounding her mother's death. Another likely murder victim of Holmes was Emmeline Sigran. She was said to have started working at the hotel in May 1892, but disappeared in the same year, precisely in December. Speculations were made that she was probably pregnant by Holmes and died while Holmes was, yet again, trying to carry out an abortion on her. Although Holmes ran the hotel, he later took a job on Dearborn Street in the Chemical Bank building, and there he met Benjamin Pitazel. Pitazel was a carpenter and had a criminal record. He had been exhibiting a coal bin he invented in the chemical bank building when the two met. Holmes and Pitazel became close friends, and the latter was once described by a district attorney as Holmes's tool, his creature. It was also said that Pitazel had been Holmes's right-hand man when it came to carrying out the crimes he committed. In early 1893, a one-hit actress named Minnie Williams moved to Chicago. According to Holmes, the both of them met at an employment office, after which he offered her a job at his hotel as a personal stenographer. Minnie agreed, and after much persuasion from Holmes, she transferred the deed of her property in Fort Worth, Texas on April 1893 to someone named Alexander Bond. Meanwhile, Alexander Bond was one of the many aliases Holmes used. Holmes signed the deed over to Pitazel under the by name Benton T. Lyman. The following month, Holmes and Minnie made a formal appearance as husband and wife and got an apartment in Chicago's Lincoln Park. When Minnie's sister Annie came to visit in July, she wrote a note to her aunt that she was going to escort 
brother Harry to Europe. However, neither Minnie nor Annie were ever seen again after July 5th, 1893. Holmes and Pitazel carried on as friends into the following year, 1894. On January 17, 1894, Holmes married a third wife, Georgina Yoke, while still married to Clara and Marta. The two got married in Denver, Colorado. By July, he had already left Chicago after insurance companies threatened to have him arrested for arson. He left for Fort Worth, a property he inherited from Minnie. However, he still got arrested barely a few days later. In late July, Holmes was arrested on the charge of selling mortgage goods in St. Louis, Missouri. Although he was bailed out, he met a convicted outlaw in the short time he spent in prison. The man was called Marion Hedgepeth and had a 25-year sentence. Holmes came up with a plan to dupe an insurance company out of $10,000 by taking out a policy on himself and faking his death. He promised Marion a $500 commission if he would give him the name of a lawyer he could trust to help him carry out his plan. Marion referred him to a St. Louis attorney named Jephtha Howe. Together, the two decided to get to work. However, despite his careful planning, Holmes's plan failed because the insurance company became suspicious and chose not to pay. He then decided to invent a similar plan with Pitazel. Pitazel was fine with the idea of faking his own death so that his wife would be paid $10,000 for the life insurance policy, which would have been shared between Holmes and Jephtha. According to the plan, Holmes was supposed to find a corpse that would play the role of Pitazel. Instead, he turned on Pitazel and killed him. Using chloroform, Holmes knocked out his trusted right-hand man into unconsciousness and set him on fire with benzene. Holmes received the insurance payout and also went on to further manipulate Pitazel's wife. He convinced her to place three out of her five children in his custody. Holmes traveled all through the northern United States with the three children and eventually into Canada. He also escorted Pitazel's wife on similar routes, using several monikers, and constantly lied about her husband's death to her. He claimed that Pitazel was in London, hiding. When her three children went missing, Holmes lied to her about their whereabouts as well. Holmes' killing spree came to an end on November 17, 1894, after he was tracked down from Philadelphia by the private Pickerton National Detective Agency. He was eventually arrested in Boston, and the backstory seemed to be that Marion Hedgepath, out of spite, had told the police of Holmes' plan to scam insurance policies. Holmes was also held on an outstanding warrant for horse theft. He had stolen some horses from Texas and sold them in St. Louis after the World Fair in Chicago. At the time, Holmes was arrested. It appeared like he was going to leave the country. So the suspicions of the police rose and they decided to investigate his hotel, also known as the Murder Castle. During the investigation, they found various dismembered and decomposed bodies. The police investigation went as far as Chicago, Indianapolis, and Toronto. During the Toronto investigation, the police discovered the bodies of Pitazel's children. Linking Holmes to their murders, he was immediately arrested and convicted. Although Holmes confessed to the murders of 27 other people, speculations revealed that he was responsible for the death of over 100 people from investigations and missing persons reports. After the bodies of Pitazel's children were found, Alice and Nellie, Holmes confessed to killing the two by pushing them into a large trunk and locking it from the outside. He said he drilled a hole in the trunk's lid and passed one end of a hose through it while the other he attached to the end of a gas line. The girls died of asphyxiation and later on he buried their bodies in the cellar of his rental house in Toronto. As for Howard, Holmes reported that he went on to a local drugstore to buy the drugs he killed Howard with. He then went to a repair shop to sharpen the knives he used in dismembering the boy's body before eventually setting it aflame. Howard's teeth and bits of bones were found in the chimney of Holmes's house. In August 1895, Holmes's hotel mysteriously burnt to the ground. According to a newspaper clipping from the New York Times, two men were spotted entering the building from the back between 8 and 9 p.m. About 30 minutes later, they were spotted leaving the building again. The hotel went up in flames shortly after, and during the investigation, the police found a half-empty gas container under the back steps of the building. 
By October 1895, Holmes was to face trial. He was tried for the murder of Benjamin Pitazel and was found guilty. Holmes was given a death sentence by hanging. However, it wasn't until May 7, 1896 that Holmes was hanged. He was hanged at the Philadelphia County Prison. Up until his death, it was said that Holmes appeared calm and amiable. If he was scared or anxious, he didn't give much away. Regardless, he asked that his coffin be put in cement and buried 10 feet underground to prevent grave robbers from stealing his body. Holmes died 20 minutes after they sprung the trap. The case of H.H. H. Holmes may have been old, but this next one isn't far off, despite being a modern case. What does this mean, you ask? A killer granny, that is. Tamara Samsonova, who has been dubbed the Granny Ripper by the press. Samsonova is said to have murdered at least 11 people, and some sources even claim that she went as far as eating some of her victims. Let's find out more about this senior citizen's fascinating motives for this string of murders. Tamara Samsonova was born on the 5th of February, 1947, in the city of Ushur in Russia. Not much is known about her family and childhood. After graduating high school, Tamara moved to Moscow, where she studied at the Moscow State Linguistic University. When she graduated from university, Tamara relocated to St. Petersburg. It was there that she met and married her husband, Alexei Samsonova. In 1971, when she was 24 years old, Tamara and her husband, Alexei, moved into their newly built panel house, identified as house number four on Dmitrov Street. To make ends meet, Tamara found work in the travel industry, at first as a travel agent and then at the Grand Hotel Europe, while Alexei worked in a car repair plant. Tamara was in active work for a total of 16 years. For many years, all seemed to be well. However, trouble struck the Samsonova lovebirds when, in 2000, Tamara filed a missing person report with the police after her husband had suddenly disappeared. In her distress, Tamara told neighbors that Alexei must have run off with another woman. But she only told the police that she was worried that he had suddenly disappeared. Investigations and efforts were made to locate or rescue Alexei, but to no avail. This must have been very challenging for Tamara, as the two had been married for nearly 30 years. Of course, after learning about her crimes and brutal nature, many have concluded that Tamara killed her husband. But at the time, no one suspected a thing. After Lexi disappeared, Tamara, who was 53 years old then, had to consider the prospect of spending her retirement days alone in the house, where she had only ever lived with her husband. After her husband disappeared, Tamara decided to rent out one of the rooms in her apartment to raise money and keep herself company. In the summer of 2001, a man named Vladimir occupied this space and the two established a good relationship. However, as with all relationships, there are bound to be disagreements. So after the two had a falling out, sometime toward the end of the year, Vladimir left the apartment. In 2003, Tamara was able to find someone who stuck around for much longer. A 44-year-old from Norilska named Sergi Potanin was the one who moved in the room shortly around this time. Sadly, once again, Tamara had numerous falling outs with this tenant, who eventually got sick of her constant troubles and took off. Or so people thought. When interviewed, Tamara's neighbors mentioned that the elderly lady would often swear at her tenants in the hallways and bang on the radiators. So when Sergi was suddenly nowhere to be seen, the neighbors reasonably assumed that he had grown weary of Samsonova and moved back to his home in Norilska. However, future investigations by the authorities suggest otherwise. According to investigators, on the 6th of September 2003, during one of their quarrels, the then 56-year-old Tamara killed Sergi. She then went on to dismember his corpse before discarding it on the streets of St. Decius Way. After Sergi's departure, Tamara continued taking in tenants, on and off, usually men who were a few years younger than her. The money she made from this allowed her to enjoy a reasonably comfortable retirement. This routine continued for over a decade until the pensioner found herself alone again in March of 2015, when her apartment needed to undergo some renovations. Luckily, one of her friends introduced her to 79-year-old Valentina Nikolaevna Ulanova just in time. 
As Ulanova also lived on Dimitrov Street, the mutual friend convinced her to let Tamara stay with her for some time while Tamara's house was undergoing renovations. According to the agreement, Tamara was to stay at Ulanova's in exchange for helping with the chores, as Ulanova was ailing and was also older than Tamara. Ulanova agreed and Tamara began living in her house. Over time, Tamara enjoyed living in Ulanova's house and had no intentions of leaving. This development might have been welcomed by the 79-year-old if things were going smoothly, but sadly they were not. As was common between her and her own tenants in the past, Tamara had constant arguments with Ulanova throughout her stay at the older pensioners. Their relationship turned sour and Ulanova eventually asked Tamara to leave, but she was not having any of it and still found ways to stick around. The determined house guest managed to prolong her stay by helping with the chores, which Ulanova could not easily do herself, and by flat out ignoring the quit notice that had been issued to her. After another quarrel over washing the dishes, which was the last straw, Samsonova decided to settle the matter once and for all. On the 24th of July that year, Samsonova traveled all the way to Pushkin and decided to visit a pharmacy. There, she convinced the pharmacist to sell her quite a large dose of phenazepam, a Russian-made schizophrenia pill. She was able to get away with this suspicious purchase by drawing on the fact that she had previously been hospitalized on three occasions in psychiatric homes. To put things in perspective, phenazepam is a benzodiazepine drug that was developed in the Soviet Union in 1975. It has sedative effects and is known for making the user feel calm and relaxed, as well as relieving physical tension. However, some inexperienced chefs abused the pill's chemical effects on people and included it in their dishes as muscle relaxants as well as other devious reasons. On her way home, Samsonova bought some Olivier salad along with some other household goods and groceries. Now, it so happened that Olivier salad was her host's favorite dish. Tamara crushed up about 50 phenazepam pills into the salad and offered it to an unsuspecting Ulanova probably as a peace offering after their earlier argument. As it was already about 7 p.m., which was way past her usual bedtime, Samsonova retired to bed almost immediately after dinner. When she woke up at 2 a.m., she found Ulanova lying effectively unconscious on the kitchen floor. Upon discovering this, Samsonova grabbed her tools, two knives and a hacksaw, and began dismembering the older pensioner's body. First, she sawed off Ulanova's head and then removed her limbs. Then, she cut her torso in two and used the kitchen knives to cut it all up into tiny pieces. To dispose of the pieces, she had to leave the house and return several times, carrying plastic bags. Although, retrieved CCTV footage did not show where she took the bags. Authorities later learned that she had been making trips to a nearby pond. Despite her attempts to be thorough, Samsonova left some pieces of Ulanova's body scattered around the apartment. CCTV footage showed her carrying a large saucepan, which has fuel and supported speculations that she cooked and ate the bodies of her victims, or at least parts of them. After the crime was committed, three days went by until the 26th of July, 2015, when a couple went on a walk with their dog. The dog began acting strangely when the three walked by a pond, so much so that they eventually went back. After they got close enough to the pond, the couple and their pet spotted shower curtains wrapped around something that caught the dog's interest. Curious, they decided to take a closer look, and upon inspection, the couple found out that the package contained cut up pieces of a human body. The authorities were immediately informed, and the investigation began. It was not until the next day that it was established that the remains belonged to Valentina Ulanova. This was determined after a door-to-door -door survey of residents in the area, asking each one if they had noticed any suspicious or unusual activities recently. In response to the inquiry, residents had mentioned that they had not seen their neighbor, Ulanova, for some time. When the authorities arrived at Ulanova's apartment, Samsonova was the one who answered the door. Upon searching the apartment, traces of blood and fastenings from the shower curtain were found. When asked why the apartment was in such a state, Tamara stated that Ulanova had insulted her. So she had no choice but to end her life as she was scared to return to her own house. 
With this confession, the authorities immediately arrested the 68-year-old. Further investigations revealed that Samsonova kept a diary with entries in Russian, German, and English. Investigators reported that she recorded even the littlest details of her daily life in this diary, as she did not want to miss a thing. As expected, a proper inspection of the diary provided more proof for the police's investigation. In one of her entries, Samsonova confessed to killing her former tenant, Sergi. She wrote, I killed my tenant, Volodya. I cut him to pieces in the bathroom with a knife and put the pieces of his body in a plastic bag and threw them away in different parts of the Franzinski district. She also records growing fond of living with Ulanova. As she writes in another entry, I love Valia, as she called her housemate. In a jarring turn of events, Tamara offered to take investigators back to the apartment and demonstrate how she dismembered Ulanova's body using a dummy. She showed them how she cut off parts of the body, starting with her head, and wrapped them in the shower curtain. As Ulanova was too heavy, she was forced to dispose of her legs and hips in the backyard instead of taking them to a farther location. Then, in an attempt to conceal her victim's identity, she boiled her head and hands in the saucepan she had been seen carrying. She threw these into the garbage skip, which was taken away every Saturday. More investigations are still being carried out in this case, particularly respect to the disturbing contents of her diary. But investigators have chosen not to reveal details until they are satisfied with their findings. While we already have a few answers, one cannot help but wonder just how and, more importantly, why an average woman from St. Petersburg would take an interest in killing people and meticulously disposing of their bodies in the way that Samsonova did. As it turns out, these questions were answered by Samsonova herself and a few people who knew her. Tamara told reporters herself that she was troubled by a maniac upstairs who pushed her to murder people. According to her, living with Ulanova quieted this maniac, which was why she was defiant when asked to leave. This intertwines with the result of her psychiatric evaluation, suggesting schizophrenia as the basis for most of her gory deeds. Marina Krivenko, who lived next door to Sansonova and would sometimes visit her, revealed to the authorities that the killer was a huge fan of Andre Chikadillo's story, a horrific case we have explored on Twisted Minds before in a 45-minute special. Andre dubbed the Butcher of Rostov, was a serial killer who had ravaged the Soviet Union a few decades before Samsonova. Andre was a wartime survivor who went on to spread the evil he had experienced during the war to the world around him in a number of unspeakable ways, starting with sexual crimes and working his way up to murder when his sexual desires were not met. Samsonova's admiration for him can easily be spotted as she chopped up her victim's bodies in a similar fashion to his. In addition to her mental illness and admiration for the historical serial killer, Samsonova dabbled in the dark arts. Investigations revealed that the old woman owned a stack of texts on astrology and magic. And one of her neighbors told the authorities that she was keen on these topics. While her interest in these is not a valid indication of a murderous nature, it is suspected that some of her killings were performed as part of some occult ritual, which would be concerning if that is the case. During her first hearing on the 29th of July, 2015, Samsonova admitted to committing the crime without any hassle. This must have shocked the small crowd as the elderly lady looked so well put together and fragile, even during the trial. Shockingly, Tamar herself seemed pretty relieved that she had been caught. When reporters approached her, she seemed more concerned about her neighbors and the whole country knowing about her crime than the actual punishment she was about to get for the crime. She even blew a kiss to reporters and other observers. During the hearing, Tamara was asked to address the court and she explicitly stated that she had planned all the murders up until one so that she might be found out and arrested. According to her, there was no other way to live and it would be better to spend the rest of her days in prison. At the end of the trial, the judge said to her, I have been asked to arrest you. What do you think? She responded, you decide. I'm obviously guilty and deserve a punishment. When the judge announced that she would be kept in custody for the duration of the investigation, Samsonova clapped gleefully 
On the 26th of November 2015, the results of a forensic psychiatric examination Samsonova had undergone revealed that she was a danger to society and herself. She is thought to be dealing with schizophrenia, having been admitted to a psychiatric hospital in the past. Because of this, the senior citizen was placed in a specialized institution, the Kazan Clinic, until investigations were over, possibly during her sentence. In December of 2015, Tamara was finally sentenced to life imprisonment, and according to the court's judgment, she was to serve her sentence in a mental facility. Right now, Tamara is 75 years old and is expected to be spending her final days in the Kazan Clinic. The year was 1987, and somewhere in Rodeo, California, a 59-year-old man was stricken with fear inside a trailer home, surrounded by at least a dozen policemen, rushing to fit into a bulletproof vest as they hurriedly prepared to escort him out of town. The man's name was Lawrence Singleton, and he was an ex-convict whom the government was desperately trying to resettle. But the community wasn't having any of it. In fact, there was a mob coming for him. Mothers, fathers, and vigilant neighbors who wouldn't resist until Lawrence Singleton was as far away from the community as the West was from the East. Hell, some of the richer inhabitants were ready to bankroll a one-way trip to Cuba or Congo for Mr. Singleton. They would only feel safe if he was removed permanently from the continent. And if he decided he wouldn't leave, some people were more than ready to send Mr. Singleton back to his maker in the most violent way possible. This was how much Lawrence Singleton had come to be hated in 1988. So the question we should be asking is, who was he? What had he done to become so reviled and despised? How was he able to incite that level of violence from regular, mostly peaceful folks? In other words, what were the good people of Rodeo, California really afraid of? Welcome or welcome back to Twisted Minds. My name is James and today we are going to deep dive into the sickening inhumanity of Lawrence Singleton and the miraculous, almost unbelievable survival of Mary Vincent. Our story today begins with a young Mary Vincent, whose unfortunate encounter with Lawrence Singleton served as the catalyst for the overwhelming infamy tied to his name today. One of seven children, Mary Vincent was born in 1963 to strict parents. Her father worked as a mechanic at their home in Las Vegas, and her mother juggled a military career and a side hustle as a professional blackjack dealer. By the time Mary was a teenager, she had a generic yet conflicting life. On one hand, she was into competitive dancing and wanted to explore the world as a performer. On the other hand, her parents' marriage was on the brink of collapse. And like many teenagers in her shoes, the meltdown of her parents' relationship was quickly stirring a rebellion within her. It started gradually. She would cut classes on some occasions and on some others, she would skip school altogether. Eventually, she was just 15 when she ran away from her parents' home to live with an older boyfriend in Sausalito, California. However, her boyfriend would soon get into some serious trouble. He was accused of assaulting another girl and was promptly arrested, which caused Mary Vincent to return to Vegas. But she didn't go back home to her parents. She wandered a bit, sleeping in unlocked cars at night and hustling free meals during the day. Eventually, she decided to travel to her grandparents' home. They lived in Corona, California, quite the distance from where she was, but Mary was lost and she desperately needed stability in her life. She promised herself she would work hard at becoming a professional dancer once she was settled. Wild as it may seem in our time, it was common practice for teenagers to hitchhike a ride from complete and hopefully friendly strangers, a concept that we now frown on because of the long history of unfortunate events that the practice has led to. But the year was 1978. The hippie movement might have been dying, but the spirit was still very much alive. And what was the alternative? To go back home to a broken family? That wasn't an option for Mary Vincent. So on the 29th of September, 1978, she walked a freeway, holding up a sign that read, heading south, but she wasn't alone. There were two other hitchhikers behind her, headed in a similar direction. After a couple hours of standing, a blue van pulled over, and sitting behind the wheel was 50-year-old Lawrence Bernard Singleton. This was 10 years before the Rodeo incident. He was 50 at the time, and to Mary Vincent, he looked like someone's harmless grandpa. 
At this point, I should be telling you some details about Lawrence Singleton's past. A backstory? A brief biography? Turbulent childhood? Something? Unfortunately, we know very little about this man's past. We know that he was a sea merchant, a native of Tampa, Florida, and that his only sibling, a man named Walter, had distanced himself and wouldn't breathe a word about his brother's existence. However, the world was about to learn more from Lawrence's future than his past could ever tell. When Lawrence Singleton pulled up in front of the three hitchhikers, he handpicked Mary Vincent as the only one whom he would be willing to give a ride. To the other hitchhikers, this was odd. A 50-year-old stranger who was alone in a van didn't bid good tidings. To make matters more suspicious, all three of them were headed south, in the same direction. And there was more than enough space for all of them. So it made very little sense that Lawrence was refusing to carry all three of them. But you know how someone can be so tied up that their brain cops out and makes poor decisions by default? Well, that was exactly what happened to Mary Vincent. Despite the warnings from the other two hitchhikers, she accepted Lawrence Singleton's offer. She had been on the road for a little too long. She had spent enough nights in other people's cars and she hadn't properly processed all of the emotional baggage that had hit her over the last couple of days. She was young and she was trusting. Everything was in place for her to make a bad decision. Now, Lauren Singleton wasn't exactly headed in her direction, but he offered to turn around at a certain point for her. She was glad, another gesture of goodwill. When she had settled into the vehicle and they were well on their way, Mary pulled out a cigarette and was about to take a puff when she sneezed. Then, the man reached over, touched her back, and pulled her to himself saying, let's see if you're sick. Immediately, Mary got defensive, and rightfully so. Why would he, a stranger whom she had just met, feel comfortable enough to touch her? So, she withdrew from his grasp, leaned back, and Lawrence turned his attention back to the road. Some moments later, Mary fell asleep. By the time she woke up, she noticed the signs on the road were all wrong. They were headed in the wrong direction. All of her instincts kicked in, and she picked up a stick that was lying on the car floor, pointed it to Lawrence, and insisted that he turn the car around. She told him that he knew what he was doing. Lawrence Singleton shrugged it off as a simple mistake and agreed to turn. However, he told her he wanted to take a leak, so he drove off-road, parked, and got out of the vehicle. Left alone in the vehicle with just her thoughts, Mary Vincent began to soak in the danger of her situation. She knew she was in trouble, however, to her, the man looked old and unhealthy. She felt that she could easily overpower or outrun him. Then she realized that her shoelaces were untied. So, when she came down from the vehicle, she bent to do her laces, and Lauren Singleton hit her with a sledgehammer to the back of her head, knocking her out cold. By the time Mary would regain consciousness, she was naked and tied up in the back of his van in such a way that she wouldn't be able to move, even if she tried. He drove down toward a canyon, and when they were secluded enough, he began to assault her. Through a harrowing night, this vile man repeated the assault about six times. At some point, Mary Vinson just wanted to die. It was unbearable for her. She kept asking him, why, but got no response. And when he was done and the sun was beginning to rise, she begged him, set me free. So he cut her loose, pulled her out of the van, and then he taunted her with these words. You want to be set free? I'll set you free. He pulled out a hatchet from his toolbox, took her left arm, and swung at it. Immediately, Mary grabbed at his arm. Too much was happening at once. She was in shock. She did not realize what this monster was doing. He took another swing at her left arm, and she began to fall. Her hand came off her body, but it was firmly gripping Lawrence Singleton's arm. It wasn't until she looked at her own hand that she realized what had happened. So, she began thrashing, screaming, hoping that someone would hear. But this diabolical man wasn't done. He reached for her right hand and hacked at it repeatedly until it came off. The horror of what had just happened to her was intense and her body went into shock. And the last thing she said she could remember as she faded was Lawrence trying to pry off her dismembered left hand that was still gripping tightly to his hand. And somehow, this monster still wasn't done. 
After this, he dragged what he must have thought was a lifeless body to a cliff and threw her down to her death before stuffing her into a culvert. Anyone would have died. In fact, there are countless who have suffered fewer horrors and not made it. But somehow, within Mary Vincent's core, her will wouldn't let her go. They say when people are at their lowest, most desperate point, that is when you know their true nature. For Mary Vincent, who was in the ditch slowly bleeding to death, her mind raced and pondered over one thought. If you die here, this man will try to do this to another girl. Mary wasn't thinking about herself when the adrenaline took over. She was thinking about other girls like her. So, she mustered strength from every fiber of her being and pulled herself up. Her arms were bleeding buckets, so she resourcefully dug both severed arms into the mud to reduce the bleeding and climbed out. She walked until she could hear the sound of vehicles zooming across the highway. Eventually, she got to the road and the first vehicle that saw her was a red sports car with two guys in it, but they got scared and drove off. She didn't blame them. No one could. She was armless, covered in blood, actively bleeding, and completely naked. It wasn't a sight for the faint-hearted. Eventually, a couple on their way to their vacation saw her, and without asking questions, wrapped her in a towel and took her to the hospital. When they would eventually ask her, all she could say was, he to me. She was taken into surgery immediately and given prosthetic arms. When the police arrived, they questioned her about the terrible attack, but the trauma had eaten deep. They had to use forensic hypnosis to get Mary to give them a detailed account of the events surrounding her attack and a detailed description of the mutilator who attacked her. It worked. One of her severed limbs was later found near the Golden Gate Bridge, and the sketch of her attacker circulated the media until a California man recognized the killer as his neighbor, Lawrence Singleton. He was promptly arrested, and 11 days after the attack, Mary was able to confirm that he was indeed her attacker. Between his capture and trial, Lawrence Singleton garnered serious infamy. The story was too gory. How could anyone be so depraved? That was the question everyone was asking. It was beyond surreal. The media began to call Lawrence Singleton the Mad Chopper. Five months after the incident, the trial of the Mad Chopper would begin. In court, Mary Vincent had to sit through the painful proceedings of the trial. She was only 10 to 15 feet away from the monster, and any time she had to take the stand, she would have to walk in front of him. During one of those times, he whispered something that shook her to her core. He said, If it's the last thing I do, I will finish the job. When Lawrence Singleton took the stand, he told so many incongruent lies. He said Mary Vincent was a $10 an hour prostitute and that she had tried to maim him. He also spoke about the two other hitchhikers, saying that they were in on it. He maintained his innocence. In his delusional skull, he wasn't the one who committed the crime. But his lies were pointless. They didn't add up, and the jury didn't believe him. They could not. Not when Mary Vincent was both the key witness and living evidence. Eventually, he was found guilty and sentenced to 14 years behind bars, which was the maximum he could legally be served. At the time, judges were not allowed to impose consecutive sentences for each felony. So the most Singleton could get was 14 years and four months. If Singleton had been sentenced today for the charges he was convicted of in the 1978 case, he would have drawn multiple 25 year to life sentences. And a judge could have stacked the sentences for each conviction instead of letting Singleton serve them simultaneously. Singleton would not have been eligible for parole until he had served 49 years, which is more than six times as long as he spent behind bars. Even the judge was distressed and publicly stated that if he could, he would have ensured that Singleton spent the rest of his miserable life locked up. Mary and the public were understandably upset over the sentence, deeming it too short and unjust. This would lead to the passing of the Singleton Bill in California, which ceases the early release of criminals who used torture in their crime and allowed for 25 to life sentences as well. However, while the law got tougher, Singleton got the easier end of the stick. Throughout the time he was in jail, Mary was terrified. At home, she was having trouble with her family and felt isolated at her specialized school for the handicapped. Her dreams of becoming a dancer were dashed. She moved away as soon as she graduated 
and became secretive about her life and location. Traumatized and depressed, Vincent became anorexic, had trouble leaving the house, and saw many of her close relationships fall apart. She ended up living in fear for years. All the while Mary lived in agony, San Quentin released Lawrence Singleton on parole after serving only eight years and four months because, in their words, he had been a model prisoner. He became a teacher's aide in prison and stayed away from trouble. For them, this was enough to let a mutilator off easy. The public expressed massive outrage against this act of leniency. The unremorseful prisoner was still maintaining his innocence. Just before his release, his psychiatrist stated the following. Because he is so out of touch with his hostility and anger, he remains an elevated threat to others' safety inside and outside prison. After this evaluation, he was let loose. However, if Lawrence Singleton thought he had escaped proper judgment from the justice system, he was about to receive a wake-up call from the people. No town wanted the monster in their city. Lawrence Singleton went on a parole odyssey. In April 1987, the people of Antioch, Contra Costa County learned that their town had been chosen for Singleton's parole. More than 10,000 people signed a petition that blocked the state's attempt. Meanwhile, both Nevada and his home state of Florida rejected him. So the state of California chose Martinez as the county where Singleton would serve his parole. On the 24th of that same month and a day before he was released, Martinez city council officers obtained restraining orders that would block Singleton from settling anywhere in their county. The next day, Singleton, 59, was released from California men's colony at San Luis Obispo and had to spend some time heavily guarded in a secret location in San Francisco. Three days later, officials in San Francisco caught wind of it and obtained a restraining order barring him. Reporters found him in a hotel in Redwood City and he had to be whisked away. Over the next month, county officials of Contra Nosta actively thwarted the state's covert attempts at keeping him amongst them. When they moved him to Richmond, the mayor publicly denounced Singleton and joined demonstrations to force him out. Eventually, he found himself in the town of Rodeo, where several hundred angry people protested outside his apartment. Some people were prepared to lynch the man if the state insisted on keeping him in their town. When the pressure reached a fever pitch, the governor of California at the time, George Duke Magian, announced that Singleton would serve the remainder of his parole in a trailer on the grounds of San Quentin Prison. Lauren Singleton joined Alcoholics Anonymous and claimed he was sober. Meanwhile, Mary Vinson remained in hiding. Singleton felt as though he was the victim in the attack against Mary Vinson and decided to sue her. He began telling anyone who would care to listen that while he was in jail, he considered the alleged events and determined that he was not guilty. He said he remembered Vinson threatening to accuse him of rape and that she brandished a stick at him. He decided that this was the reason he had become violent, maintaining mistreatment from the courts. He filed a complaint, suing Vincent for forcible kidnap for the purposes of robbery. Can you even begin to imagine the madness lurking between this monster's ears? He feigned sympathy for Vincent, claiming he almost vomited three times and that he could not sleep several nights after the act. However, this suit never gained traction, and the courts dismissed it. Soon, some details began to come to light in the aftermath of his early release. It turned out that Mary Vincent was not the only one who feared Singleton. He had a daughter, Deborah, who shared some details about the nature of her father. When she found out that he was getting out of jail, she also fled and hid, asking law enforcement if there was any way they could keep him behind bars for longer. Considering how he had just used his status as a father to lure Mary into his car, it only made sense to her. In her own words, I asked California prison personnel what could be done to keep him in longer, and I was told there was nothing. They suggested I obtain a restraining order at the time of his release. Sorry, but I mean this quite sarcastically. I tell you he is a danger. I said that before the first crime, I've changed my name multiple times and am moving across state lines. And you all suggest a piece of paper that will tell him exactly where I am, what my name is, and not to come within 300 feet of me. However, he didn't go looking for his estranged daughter after his parole was over. 
He figured that he had no place in California, so he relocated to Florida. Three years later, he was arrested for theft and sentenced to two years. Once again, he served only a fraction of the time. He continued with his petty theft, stealing small, inexpensive objects, and was relatively free until the 19th of February, 1997. A local house painter was going about his business when he witnessed what he could only describe as a horrific scene. A naked man covered in blood was relentlessly stabbing a woman who lay motionless on the sofa. It was macabre and mindless. From where he stood, he could hear bones crunching with each stab. So he scrambled to call the police. And when they responded to the call and knocked on the door of this nude, bloodbathed killer, it turned out to be Lawrence Singleton once again. 20 years after his first crime, the mad chopper had struck, but this time, unlike Mary Vincent who survived, he finished the job. When the police got to the door of his apartment, Lawrence nonchalantly responded, still naked and still covered in blood. He had not attempted to clean himself up. When they asked him why he was covered in blood, he told them that he hurt his finger. And when they told him that they would like to question him, Lawrence excused himself, leaving the door half open. The lifeless body of his victim, Roxanne Hayes, was clearly in view, still on the couch. He had not even bothered to hide the body or his crime. This man wasn't even bothered about getting caught. His victim, Roxanne Hayes, a mother of three, and an escort who did what she could to support her family, had agreed to meet him for $20. In court, Lawrence Singleton told the most brazen and bizarre account of events. It was as unbelievable as was remarkably dumb. He claimed that she tried to make more money than they agreed upon. They struggled and she picked up a knife that he had kept on the living room table to chop vegetables while watching TV. The struggle lasted about 30 seconds and each time he pulled Hayes' arm downward to pry the knife from her hand, according to him, she stabbed herself each time. But this bull story doesn't end there. He continued to say that he didn't realize she was injured until she lay dying on his sofa and asked him to hold her in his arms. Then he said she put both arms around him and they embraced. At that point, he said, he realized Hayes was injured and bleeding heavily. He wanted to call 911, but picked up the remote control instead. He then said that he told her they had to get to the hospital, but when he tried to help her walk out the door, his knees went out and they collapsed on the dining room floor. Then he sat there and cried and rubbed her face and tried to talk to her, but she didn't respond because she was dead. I can only imagine how the jurors must have felt with this story that feels like the plot of a grossly underfunded B-movie. Everyone was ready to finally and permanently put this man behind bars, and they had someone who would ensure the error of 20 years before wasn't repeated. Mary Vincent flew in from California to Florida to testify on behalf of Roxanne. She went into great detail about what had happened to her and gave them a vivid idea of the kind of monster he was. Justice would not be cheated again. After the trial was over, it took the jurors only four hours to come to a guilty verdict. On April 14, 1998, Singleton was given a death sentence for the senseless and horrific murder of Roxanne Hayes. Unsurprisingly, Lawrence Singleton appeared to not care about the sentence. He eventually admitted that he killed her. On the 28th of December, while awaiting his execution, Lawrence Singleton died from cancer at the age of 74. In the aftermath of this man's despicable life, there have been questions. We know that no one wakes up to commit crimes of the nature that Singleton committed. Many have been wondering how many women he must have killed in the past whose death was never linked to him. How many victims are currently off the California freeway begging to be found? Victims that, unfortunately, didn't have the same luck or will that Mary Vincent possessed. So, what about Mary Vincent? How has she been since the death of Singleton? Well, no one can say she's been good. After the attack, her leg had to be used to reconstruct her arms. This reality ended her childhood dreams of dancing. Years after her recovery, Mary got married and divorced. Her trauma had caused her serious stress and depression. Eventually, she became a mother of two boys. From there, her life began to change for the better. She began to heal and establish close relationships as her new family became the source of her strength. Vincent also learned to paint, draw, and sketch. 
art brought her immense joy, as well as a new direction for her life. Her works have sold for thousands of dollars since, and if you happen to meet her, you wouldn't see a trace of Lawrence Singleton's crime on her demeanor. She has succeeded in converting everything to strength. Up next, we have a truly twisted killer. This man would take the lives of young girls and then send a box with their bones to their families. In the year 1988, a new type of fear stole its way into the hearts and minds of everyone living in Saitama Prefecture of Japan. A fear that sent shivers down the spine of even the most vigilant parents. In just five months, two girls had gone missing, vanished without a trace, and now there was news of a third. If there had been any doubt, this news shattered it. Someone or something was abducting their daughters. And to make matters more delicate, two of the girls were just four years old and one was seven. The third girl's name was Erica Namba and her father told the police that she was returning home from her friend's house when she was taken. Mind you, this was a brief trip that she, along with many others her age, had made countless times before. Their neighborhood had always been safe. So, as Erica's parents continued to pray for their daughter's safe return, the police worked tirelessly to find the little girl, recognizing the connection between all three cases. But, with no suspects and no solid leads, Erica Namba's case, like the two girls before hers, grew cold, until something incredibly sinister happened. Some days after Erica's disappearance, the Namba household received a phone call. Erica's mother picked up the phone and frantically said, hello? She heard nothing at first. When she tried to speak again, the eerie sound of someone breathing heavily came through the receiver. Terrified, she cut the call and ran to her husband who was in another room. A few seconds later, the mysterious caller rang again. This time, Erica's dad answered the phone. And once again, the same thing happened. No words, just that sinister breathing. At the time, the grieving couple believed that it had to be a twisted prank call from an equally twisted individual. But the truth was, on the other end of the call was the only person who knew where their daughter was. The heavy breathing belonged to an individual so vile that he was unfit to be called human. Welcome or welcome back to Twisted Minds. My name is James and today we are going to dive into the incredibly twisted, utterly disgusting and yet painfully tragic case of Sutomu Miyazaki. Most people have boundaries. It's what helps us maintain our status as members of society. And as weird as it might sound, most serial killers know where to draw the line. Even as they pursue the diabolical desires of their depraved minds, many of them have a fence, an ironic ideological barrier that they won't cross. And I might be a killer, but I'm not a monster type of boundary that allows them to justify their evil actions. On the flip side of this coin, some serial killers appear to have no method to their madness. For them, no action is too vile, no space is too sacred, and no one is too innocent or precious to be violated. Satomu Miyazaki falls into this category of serial killers. A man so vile that the Japanese media called him several names. The vampire serial killer, the otaku murderer, and the little girl killer. Sutomu Miyazaki was born prematurely on the 21st of August 1962 in Itsukaichi, Tokyo, Japan. He was also born with a visible deformity. His hands were fused directly to his wrists in such a way that he could not rotate his hands without moving his forearms. Aside from this deformity, Sutomu was also a product of incest. His father slept with his older sister and that was how he was conceived. So before Satomu was even born, he had already attained the status of persona non grata. If you consider this a relief for the man, at least his family was wealthy. His father, Katsumo Miyazaki, who is considered a perfect gentleman and adored by all in his community, also happened to be the owner of the most popular local newspaper in the Itsukaichi area at the time. And as a result, the Miyazakis had some serious wealth and considerable political influence. Unsurprisingly, Katsumo neglected his son. As an unapologetic workaholic, the man would even spend his spare time watching political videos and collecting the latest cameras, a hobby that would be shared by his son and would be integral 
to his depraved crimes down the line. Tsutomu's mother, Raiko, was not his actual mother, but rather his father's wife after he was conceived. She approached parenting by spoiling Tsutomu with toys and gadgets, including buying him a Nissan Langley in his 20s, which he would later use for his despicable crimes. Both parents were emotionally detached from Tsutomu, so much so that the man said he contemplated suicide at some point because of how casually they brushed off every personal problem he tried to talk to them about. Now, not much is known on record about his older sister, but we do know that Satomu had two younger sisters who were disgusted by him. They refused to play with him and treated him as an outsider in the house, either as a result of his deformed hands or the nature of his birth. The only person that paid real attention to him was his grandfather, Shokichi. Shokichi, like his son, was highly regarded in town and served on the city council. Shokichi was the only one who treated Satomu as a human being, and he showed unconditional love to him. He was Satomu's best friend and probably his only friend, so Satomu cherished their relationship. During this time, Satomu had developed an obsession for manga comics, so his grandfather indulged him by buying him tons of them. However, while his grandfather served as a sliver of hope at home, in school, there was no equivalent. Right off the bat, Satomu's deformity haunted him. He was just five years old when his classmates teased him for having funny hands. The joke carried on in the whole school and Satomu began hiding his hands and closing his eyes in school photos. As he grew older, his insecurity kept pace. In elementary school, Satomu Miyazaki disappeared into the background. His teachers and classmates remembered him as a quiet and lonely child who kept himself busy reading manga, and watching anime without attempting to make friends. However, Satomu still had an innocence to him that had not yet been tainted. A teacher of his also recalled an essay that he wrote in the third grade. It read, When I grow up, I want to buy a car and go driving. I'll stop at a restaurant and eat some curry rice or something. I might even visit my relatives. Added to this was Satomu's undeniable brilliance. Teachers testified that the boy had found a way to turn his isolation into an intense focus on his schoolwork. He studied hard and became the first student from his junior high school to pass the entrance exam to the prestigious Meidai Nakano High School. The school was a two hour journey from his home, but this wasn't a hassle for Satomu. He had a clear goal. His new high school was affiliated with the elite Meiji University, and he planned to study English and become a teacher, something he always had a passion for. His family was not particularly supportive of this goal. While teaching was a respected profession in Japanese society, Satomu was expected to inherit the family business, so his family felt he would grow out of it and take charge of the family trade. Meanwhile, life was about to become a whole lot harder for Satomu. By the time he had settled into senior high, another of his disabilities began to make the rounds. The rumor was that he had a penis that was incredibly short and as thin as a pencil. This was happening in the middle of puberty when he had begun to develop feelings for the opposite sex. With this news going around, his chances with the girls in his high school went from zero to negative, and he began to transition from the sweet and shy little kid to a cold, angry, reserved teenager. It was during this time that Satomu's lack of compassion began to exhibit itself. However, it was more evident in the way he treated his pets. One time, he strangled the family dog that had found its favorite spot beside his bedside. And another time, he killed two of his cats, one of which he boiled alive. This instability extended into his education as it also began to suffer the direct consequences of his actions. At some point during his three years in high school, Miyazaki began to retreat to a quiet corner to work on a comic book he was drawing, instead of attending classes or reading his books. By the time he got to his final year, he had gone from the top of his class to the 40th in a class of 56. Needless to say, his grades were so poor that he failed to receive the customary recommendation to the prestigious university he wanted. This meant he wouldn't be able to achieve his dream of becoming a teacher. Well, there'd be a whole lot longer process than most others in the field. And if you asked Tsutomu who was to blame, he would point to his disability and everyone else. At home, his family wasn't making the situation any easier for the young man. For a family like the Miyazakis, where their status was everything, Satomu had brought shame and disappointment to the home with his academic failure. 
If he felt alienated before, now he also had to bear a complete feeling of worthlessness. There was nothing for him to hold on to anymore. The one thing he had going for him was his intellect, and now there was nothing to show for it. Some say this was the tipping point for the budding serial killer, but I beg to differ. Sure, this marked the dawn of his twisted compulsions, and sure, he began to rapidly decline into his depraved cravings, but there was one more pit stop left for him. One more loss, one more event that would push the man into complete madness. In the aftermath of his academic failure, Satomu was forced to settle for a smaller college where he took up a teaching course. At the same time, he also began to work at a photography lab, courtesy of his father, where he was learning to become a photo technician. It was during this time that Satomu began exhibiting very disturbing behaviors. With his camera, Satomu targeted his college's female tennis team. He would sneak into their bathrooms and he would take what he called crotch photos while the unsuspecting ladies were undressing. Sometimes he was brazen and would just approach them, shoving a camera underneath their skirts. Why he wasn't expelled or disciplined is still a mystery, but it didn't end there. Satomu also made the most random sexual remarks to female colleagues and teachers. Around the same time, his obsession with pornography and horror films had become difficult to ignore. He was interested in all types of pornography and all types of horror films. There was a particular horror slasher film series in his collection called Guinea Pig that was so graphic it had been banned in several territories. Satomu created a universe of his own and he granted no one entrance. He showed no interest in making meaningful connections with anyone and his insecurities had finally taken root in him. By the time Satomu was 22, he had gone through and had gotten bored of adult pornography. So he began to actively seek out pornography with minors instead. As hard as it might be to believe this, pornography which involved minors was not technically illegal in Japan at the time. It only became illegal in 1999. So Satomu had no trouble finding this disgusting content. However, things were just about to get even worse. In 1988, his grandfather passed away. And I believe this was his tipping point. The death of his grandfather shook Satomu to his core. He grieved the death and wept for days. The only individual he had a connection with was gone. Now, he felt truly alone. Later, he would confess to his lawyer that he had consumed the ashes of his grandfather. In a way, in his fractured psyche, he felt he could reincarnate his grandfather within him. The whole of Japan was not prepared for the monster that Satomu would become in the aftermath of his grandfather's death. The Miyazaki era went from targeting members of the tennis team to targeting his siblings with his camera. A few weeks after his grandfather's funeral, his younger sister caught him peeping at her in the bathroom and yelled at him. Instead of retreating, Satomu got overwhelmed by an unexplainable rage, barged in and smashed her head against the bathtub. Later, when his mother suggested he spend more time at work and less time on his videos, Miyazaki exploded and beat her up. Meanwhile, his father kept ignoring his concerning behavior. In his words, he had long given up trying to talk sense into his boy. On the 21st of August of the same year his grandfather died, Satomu turned 26. The birthday itself was uneventful. Satomu recalled that no one was around to celebrate it with him, but this didn't bother him because his mind was preoccupied with other things. The next day, he sought out a birthday gift for himself. And instead of driving to a mall or cinema to give himself a treat as any normal person would do, Satomu kidnapped his first victim. On the 22nd of August, 1988, at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, four-year-old Mari Como was on her way to her friend's house in the Iruma Village apartment complex in Saitama to play when a Nissan Langley pulled up beside her. Satomu was at the wheel and he asked the innocent little girl if she would like to go somewhere cool. Mari nodded and got into his car. Satomu then drove toward a highway in western Tokyo and turned right at a popular bridge that led toward Itsukaichi, his own city. The journey took an hour and a half before he came to a grinding halt on a narrow dirt road in the woods near a popular power station. 
Satomu took Mari out of the car and walked down a mountain path for 20 minutes before finally sitting some meters away in a bush. At this point, four-year-old Mari was tired and Satomu would recall that she began to cry a little. Immediately, he panicked. He thought to himself, what if she suddenly began to cry out loud? There was a popular hiking trail not too far off and if she did, people would definitely hear her. According to Satomu, this was his justification for what happened next. Immediately, Mari began to cry. Satomu grabbed her throat and squeezed out the life from her fragile little frame. Then Satomu undressed Mari's dead body and proceeded with horrifying sexual acts. Then he laid out her body on the ground, packed up every piece of her clothing, and walked out of the forest to his car, leaving the naked body of the girl to rot in the woods, 31 miles away from her home. At home, Mari's father, Shigeo Kono, was trying to contain his fear as he rang the police. It was 6.23 in the evening. The neighbors hadn't seen his daughter that day, and she failed to return home. The police immediately began a search and over 50,000 posters of Mari were passed out to local residents and shops. The police even drove around local neighborhoods in squad cars with loudspeakers, warning families not to leave their children outside unattended. The police approached the case from two perspectives. Officially, it was a missing persons case, but behind closed doors, they were treating it as a murder. Meanwhile, Satomu, who had left the corpse to decompose, went back to hack the limbs off the body and kept them as trophies in his home. After waiting for some time, Satomu burnt Mari Kono's bones and put the ashes in a box along with some of her teeth. Investigations continued. The police interviewed two boys who said that they had seen Mari walking behind a man toward a river and a 38-year-old housewife also testified that she had spotted Mari with a stranger. With the help of the witness reports, they were able to pull up what would have been an accurate description. The suspect was male, around 170 centimeters tall, with a round, pudgy face that was framed by curly hair. He was wearing white slacks and a white summer sweater. There was only one problem with the description. Both witnesses reported that the suspect was in his late 30s when Satomu was just 26. So while the police were interrogating all the wrong suspects, Satomu went on to the next stage of his depravity. Unsurprisingly, the Japanese press were all over the case. A few days after Mari's disappearance, they approached Mari's mother, Yuki Kono, for an interview. Willing to exhaust every means possible to find her child, Yuki Kono granted the interview and expressed hope that her daughter would be found alive. Satomu read the interview in the papers and decided to send the mother a cryptic postcard. The postcard read, There are devils about. The police thought nothing of the note and brushed it off as a random, immature prank. Meanwhile, their hunt for Mari Kono had hit a dead end. After just four weeks, all the clues, leads, and suspects had been exhausted. Mari Kono's case had gone cold. She remained a missing person's case. On the afternoon of the 3rd of October, just six weeks after Mari's disappearance, Satomu struck again. He was driving through Hano Sotami Prefecture when he spotted Masami Yoshizawa, a seven-year-old first grader walking along the roadside. He convinced the little girl to get into his car and then he drove into the same hill where he committed the first murder. There, he strangled Masami to death. Then, he began stripping her body quickly before rigor mortis could set in so that he could make sexual advancements on the corpse. If you are wondering, Miyazaki painted the details for the investigators himself. While in the despicable act, the little girl's body shuddered involuntarily and scared Miyazaki so much that he immediately ran to his car, abandoning the corpse just a few meters from where Mari Kono's bones were still rotting under the sun. Like the case before, the police hit a dead end with Masami's disappearance. There were no leads and the case went cold not long after investigations began. However, they weren't blind to the connection between the two cases. There were similarities between the gender, the age of the victim, and their respective locations, considering Masami's home was only 13 kilometers from Mari's. But beyond that, there was nothing that could help them find Masami. So Masami, like Mari, was declared a missing person. On the 12th of December, barely two months after his last victim, 
Satomu struck once more. This time his victim was four-year-old Erika Namba. She was returning from a friend's house when Satomu lured her into his car. He drove for hours and Erika began to cry. She wanted to go home. It was already night when Satomu pulled into a parking area at the Youth Nature House in Naguri. He told the four-year-old to undress in the back seat and began to photograph her. Halfway through the cursed photo shoot, Erika once again began to cry and this is when Satomu grabbed her by the throat and strangled her, holding down her struggling body with his weight until she could move no more. Then Miyazaki wrapped her body in a sheet and put it in his trunk, after which he dumped her clothes in the woods behind the parking lot area and drove off. Something about the whole experience must have disoriented Satomu Miyazaki because as he was driving toward home, he suddenly lost control and his front wheel slipped into a gutter, causing his vehicle to get stuck. Panicking, he immediately switched on his hazard lights, retrieved Erica's body from his trunk, and ran into the dark woods with the sheep wrapped body in his arms. By the time he returned, two men were standing by his car. Satomu had already disposed of the body and was only with the sheep, which he casually dropped in his trunk. He got the men to help lift his car, and then he got into his car and sped away without a word of thanks. While all of this was happening, Erica's parents had already informed the police and filed a missing persons report. And the police didn't need a sign from God to make a connection between Erica Namba's disappearance and that of Mari Kono and Masami Yoshizawa. This abductor was beginning to make them look incompetent. A special operations center was set up to solve the three missing persons cases and investigators worked tirelessly to shed some light on the abductions. A couple of days later, the first break in all of the cases was made when a worker at the Naguri Youth Nature House found some of Erica's clothes. Immediately, hundreds of police pounced on the scene and began combing the area. By the next day, the police had made an important yet tragic discovery. Erica's corpse was found with her hands and feet bound with a nylon cord. At least 500 policemen explored the woods for more clues, but they found nothing. The discovery was all over the media, and soon enough, the two men that had helped Satomu with his car on the night of the murder came forward to identify it. And once again, human error came into play when they misidentified his car as a Toyota Corolla, when it was in fact a Nissan Langley. The misinformation proved costly because the police would go through more than 6,000 Corollas before realizing they were chasing the wrong lead. The recovery of Erica's body painted the entire investigation in a much grimmer picture. Everything pointed to the disappearance of Mari and Masami, leading toward a more serious crime. All the girls were from Saitama Prefecture. All lived within 30 kilometers of each other, and it was at this point that police began to publicly treat this as a serial murder case. Meanwhile, something disturbing was also happening. All three families whose daughters had been abducted began to receive several strange phone calls. The phone would ring, but when answered, the person on the other end would say nothing. And if they didn't pick up, the phone would ring for at least 20 minutes. The Nambas were the first to report it. Then the Konos began getting similar calls. And finally, it was the Yoshizawas. Some days later, Shinichi Namba, the father of Erika, received a postcard that was less cryptic than the one Yuki Kono had received a couple of weeks before. It read, Erica, cold, cough, throat, rest, death. These graphic words spurred the police into treating the postcards seriously, but their efforts were frustrated. On one hand, the hunt for Mari and Masami didn't yield any discovery, and on the other hand, Erica's murder was left unexplained. The media coverage had intensified. There was pressure on all sides. Fear was palpable in the air and everyone was rightfully terrified. Meanwhile, Satomu continued to capitalize on this fear. At about 6 a.m., Shigeo Kono, the father of Satomu's first victim, was about to leave for work when he found a box at his doorstep. He opened it and what he found inside made him call the police immediately. There were charred remains, ashes, 10 baby teeth, and photos of what were his daughter's shorts, underwear, and sandals. There was also a single sheet of paper with five words on it. It read, Mari, bones, cremated, investigate, 
prove. Just how twisted do you have to be to do that to someone's child and then torment them with proof? The police sent the teeth to the legal division of the Tokyo Dental University for examination, where a certain Dr. Kazuo Suzuki, after some analysis, determined that the teeth did not belong to Mari Kono. For Shigeo and his wife Yuki, this was hope. Yuki Kono expressed this hope in a public police press conference, where she announced that she believed that her daughter might still be alive and begged the abductor to release her. Unsurprisingly, Satomu was following the news closely, and when he saw this conference on his TV, he was incensed. He sat down and wrote a three-page letter to the Kono household where he wrote in painstaking detail the capture and dastardly acts he committed on their daughter. He also attached more proof in the form of a Polaroid picture of their daughter. The letter was titled, Crime Confession, and it was signed, Yuko Imada. A segment of this letter read, I put the cardboard box with Mari's remains in it, in front of her home. I did everything, from the start of the Mari incident to the finish. I saw the police press conference where they said the remains were not Mari's. On camera, her mother said, the report gave her new hope that Mari might still be alive. I knew then that I had to write this confession so Mari's mother would not continue to hope in vain. I say again, the remains are Mari's. On that same day, Dr. Kazo Suzuki realized an error in his examination. The teeth were in fact Mari Kono's. The bones were also found to be Mari's. It was just an unnecessarily painful day for the Kono's. Painful and public because the media caught wind of the confession and released it. This led to public outrage. The cruelty of the letter was beyond inhumane. This killer was a monster and had to be caught. The next day, the Saitama police finally classified the Mari Kono case as a homicide and set up a special center to investigate her abduction and murder. Handwriting experts were brought in to examine the confession note, but none could establish even the author's sex. They tried to find the Yuko Imada, but eventually realized it was just a pen name. However, they were able to identify that the snapshot of Mari was taken with a Mamaya 6x7 camera. They also determined that the box used to send the letter and postcard was the double-walled, corrugated kind often used to ship camera lenses. The typeface on the postcards was determined to have come from a photo typesetter and copied on an industrial copier. However, for reasons best known to the police, no investigations were launched into printing shops based on these clues. On the 11th of March, 1989, almost seven months after Mari Kono was declared missing, her parents laid her to rest. With her hands and feet missing from the remains, Shigeo Kono wept at the funeral, calling out to his daughter's abductor, when she gets to heaven, she won't be able to walk or eat. Please return the rest of her remains. After the funeral, the Konos returned home to yet another letter from Satomu's pen name, Yuko Imara. This one was titled Confession, and it graphically outlined all the changes that he had observed in Mari's dead body. Here's an excerpt of the thoroughly disgusting letter. Before I knew it, the child's corpse had gone rigid. I wanted to cross her hands over her breasts, but they wouldn't budge. Pretty soon, the body gets red spots all over it. Big red spots, like the Hinamaru flag, or like one had covered her whole body with red Hanko seals. After a while, the body is covered with stretch marks. It was so rigid before, but now it feels like it's full of water. And it smells, how it smells, like nothing you've ever smelled in this whole wide world. One can only imagine how the Konos handled the repeated emotional assault that Satomu launched against them. It is a miracle that they stayed sane through all of this. Satomu, on the other hand, was still falling deeper into his insanity. By the summer of 1989, he had become more and more unstable. He had quit work altogether and spent more hours editing the graphic videotapes of his victims. Because everyone was on high alert, he was also finding it very difficult to get his next victim. On the 1st of June, 1989, he saw some girls playing near the Akashima Elementary School and got one of the girls to take off her panties. However, when he began to photograph her, some neighbors spotted him and chased him off. If only they had crept up on the psychopathic pervert. If only they had grabbed the monster. 
his next victim would still be alive today. Satamu's end was getting closer than he was even aware of. However, one more girl had to suffer before he would be captured. Five days after the incident with the neighbors, Satamu left his house for the tennis courts near Ariaki, near Tokyo Bay, but the courts were closed. So he decided to drive toward a nearby park where he found five-year-old Ayako Nomoto playing alone. Immediately, Satamu began removing the lens cap from his camera. He approached the girl and asked her to pose for pictures. The girl obliged and he took several pictures until Ayako was comfortable with him. Then he said to her, let's take some shots inside the car. She agreed. He had parked 800 meters away from where Ayako was originally playing. When they got into the vehicle, he handed her a stick of gum and that is when the little girl noticed his disfigured hands. Unsurprisingly, and being an innocent kid, she made a comment about his hands, which spun Satomu into a calculated rage. He put on a pair of vinyl gloves and menacingly seized her by the throat, hollering as he crushed her windpipe. Here's what happens to kids who say things like that. She struggled and fought back, but it wasn't enough. Then Satamu taped her mouth, tied her hands with a rope, wrapped her body in a sheet, and placed it in the trunk of the car. This was the first body he would take home. He made a stop at a video shop to rent a camera. When he got home, he waited two hours before carrying Ayako's dead corpse inside. Then he stripped off her clothes and wiped her corpse with a towel. He laid it on a table, spread the legs, and taped her private parts apart. And then he took pictures and videos while he pleasured himself. Afterward, he bound up the hands and feet again with a cord and covered the body. Two days later, when the odor of the decomposing corpse had become unbearable, Satamu decided to dispose of the body. He hacked off Ayako's head, hands, and feet. Then he hid the torso in a public toilet near a cemetery. Then Satomu roasted Ayako's hands in his backyard, ate some of her flesh, and tossed what remained, including the skull, into the woods in front of his house. Two weeks passed and Satomu began to fear that the body would be found and linked to him, so he retrieved the remains from where he disposed of them and hid them in a bag in the storeroom behind his bedroom. Days later, he would scatter the bones in the woods burn the clothes and the plastic bags he had used to carry the body. Once again, the police and the general public were put through a heart-wrenching process of finding another little girl. Everyone was aware of her fate. They just wanted to find her remains. And they did, behind the cemetery, in the toilet where Satomu had kept Ayako's torso, they found it. And quickly, with the help of her grieving mother, identified the corpse down to the stomach contents, which matched the last meal she had cooked for her daughter on the day she was abducted. Tsutomu must have felt untouchable because he began to get bold and sloppy. And it was this sloppiness and his devious audacity that brought an end to his reign of terror. On July 23, 1989, Tsutomu did something he had never done before. He approached two sisters playing together in a Tokyo park. After talking with them for a while, he tried to convince both girls to go with him. The younger sister agreed, but the older sister ran off. Satomu took the younger sister into his car and drove her into the woods, a location that was not too far from the park. After this, he proceeded to strip the little girl naked, and then he began to take pictures of her. Meanwhile, the older sister had run off to meet her dad. She told him that his daughter, her younger sister, had followed a stranger. Immediately, they both ran to the park and began searching the premise for the little girl and her abductor. By the time the man would find his daughter in the woods, Satomu was about to insert a zoom lens into her private parts. Descending into full rage, the man beat Satomu black and blue. However, as he was retrieving his daughter, Satomu escaped and ran away from the scene. So, wasting no time, the father of the little girl immediately called the police and they came to the scene of the crime. It seemed like the universe had already decided Satomu's fate because for some reason, and even though there was every chance that he would get caught, the disgusting pervert came back for his car. And it was there that the police arrested Satomu Miyazaki. Investigation started almost immediately, and the first stop that police made was at Satomu's house, where they found more than 5,000 anime, slasher films, and pornographic tapes. Amongst the repulsive digital pile, the police would find videotapes of the atrocities he committed on his victims' corpses. Satomu and his crime made it to national TV, and his culpability spread like wildfire. 
Meanwhile, the police blocked off his house and began searching his premises. First, they found the furnace he used to burn his victim's bodies. Then they found the skull of one of the girls. Now, the outrage we spoke about earlier was not only centered around the crimes that Satomu committed, but it also spilled into other subsets of the society, namely the otaku community. If you are not familiar with the term, otaku refers to anime and manga lovers. These are individuals who love, purchase, and consume Japanese illustrated and animated content. The rough equivalent in the West would be comic book fans. Because of Satomu's extensive library of manga panels and anime content, the media called him the otaku killer, which was a problematic representation for the overwhelming majority of anime and manga lovers who were harmless. On the other hand, there was outrage toward his family. He had permanently destroyed his family's name. There was no coming back for the Miyazakis after Satomu's crimes were revealed. Ironically, his father was also disgusted by his son's despicable deeds, and he refused to pay for his attorney. However, the trial proceeded regardless. Because of the gravity of the crime, the major debate was whether Satomu was sane enough to stand trial, especially after he began to blame an ultra ego called the Rat Man for his crimes. During interrogations, he said that this Rat Man had forced him to do things he did. So three psychiatrists were tasked with determining whether or not Satomu was aware of his actions, able to differentiate between right and wrong, and capable of adequately processing human emotions. The first psychiatrist deemed Satomu completely sane, aware of his actions, and able to recognize the gravity of his crimes even if he was without remorse. The second psychiatrist diagnosed Satomu as schizophrenic, and the third psychiatrist said that Satomu had multiple personality disorders. This, according to him, would explain why he used the alias Yoku Imada to write to the families. With these conflicting reports from three psychiatrists, you might think it would have been difficult for the court to decide on whether or not he was fit for trial. You would be wrong. You see, Satomu was a terrible liar. And this rat man theory, when tested, began to quickly fall apart. He claimed that the rat man was the one who nudged him into kidnapping his victims. In a way, you could stretch this claim enough to make it make sense. What didn't make sense was Satomu's ridiculous claim that several rat men would appear when he was alone with the girls, causing the girls to mysteriously die. I mean, there was video evidence against him, evidence that he taped himself. Yeah, no one bought the crap he was selling. The court threw out his insanity plea and sentenced him to death by hanging. And on the 17th of June 2008, Satomu Miyazaki was executed. And he took his family down with him. His father's newspaper company was shut down. His father grew so depressed that he jumped off a bridge and took his own life. His in-laws divorced his sisters and aunts as everyone tried to disassociate themselves from the family. When they sent Satomu's ashes to his father's wife, she told them she didn't want them. In her own words, they could clean it up. It was like everyone in Japan was trying to purge the memory of Satomu from society, but it didn't end there. The government also made a very deliberate effort to wipe the slate clean. They shut down streets where Satomu had parked his car during the killings. They demolished the parks where some of the girls were abducted. Every memory that linked society to the monster called Satomu Miyazaki was purged. No one knows where his ashes are, but it is believed that they lie beneath an unmarked grave in an undisclosed cemetery, which I frankly believe serves as the perfect finale for a man whose life brought unimaginable pain to the families of his victims. Thanks for tuning in to Twisted Minds. That was the case of Satomu Miyazaki, and why don't you go ahead and click on one of the two videos on your screen for another one of our videos.